Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the um, March the 15th Dare County Board of Commissioners meeting. And uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, provide an invocation or, uh, from uh, George Lurie. Lurie. Uh, it's an invocation, but he opens it uh, with a couple of comments ahead of time. So I'll read those comments prior to uh, the invocation. George says, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Dare County Commissioners for allowing members of the North Dare Ministry Association to open each of your meetings with a prayer. It's been five months since my last prayer, and our county has made great strides in its handling of the coronavirus. I've asked God to guide our new president, our federal government agencies, our governors, and our state officials, and our local folks as they have planned and continue to plan a workable response to this crisis. On a personal note, my wife and I had received both of our vaccines and the Dare County Health and Human Services Department should be recognized not just in Dare County, but statewide and nationwide for the incredible coordinated fashion in which they handle getting vaccines into arms. Every day, we read of places that can't get it right. Yet we are so fortunate to live in a community where they really know how to do it perfectly. Kudos to them. I wish to continue to concentrate my thoughts into guiding our commissioners our Dare County agencies, our fantastic Dare County nonprofit groups, our local officials, and our local business owners to continue working together as well as managing the impact of this pandemic on our beach community. Under God's watch, we hope that 2021 tourist season will be as busy as 2020 was. But we cannot let our guard down as another wave can appear at any time. I am so pleased to see that almost everyone wears a mask without incident. Let our firm belief in God guide us to make the difficult decisions that lie ahead. This is what leaders do. And I applaud all of you for trying to do the right by the OBX. If only our lawmakers in Washington and Raleigh could replicate how we do business, our country would be in a better place. So now let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, sovereign of all, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to this season. We thank you and sing your praises for our lives which are in your hands, and for our souls, which are in your keeping. You are goodness. You are compassion. You have always been our hope. Soften our hearts and open our minds. Grace us with your light when our path grows dark, with your strength when we grow weary, and with your support when we falter in our resolve. King of the universe, you have commanded us to do your work for the betterment of the Outer Banks. Be with these commissioners and others who serve their county on a daily basis. Guide them in what continues to be the challenge of a lifetime. May this be God's will and let us say amen. Amen. I thank you. Stay safe and have a blessed day and blessed tourist season. May we stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. County manager. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. First on the agenda is the chairman's opening remarks. 
Thank you very much, County Manager. Y'all bear with me this evening. I have a few things. Uh, certainly like to uh, bring to everyone's attention. Um, just last week for the second time in, in uh, the last uh, three or four weeks, I had the opportunity to, de to once again uh, meet with Representative uh, Murphy uh, with the home builders. He came and spoke with the home builders. We had a couple of hours meeting uh, talking about uh, the um, uh, building industry and how he could potentially help there. I know later in the day, um, he had an opportunity to uh, meet with Commissioner Tobin, and uh, he's been uh, very supportive in our efforts with uh, our inlets, our dredging, and a number of things. And Jim, I'm, I'm sure you'll speak to that uh, with that meeting, but thank you for hosting him that afternoon. I, I know you got to show him the uh, inlet, so so that was uh, good. So he's uh, he's been here th two or three times now in the last month, so um, he's, uh, he's wanting to do what he can to help us in any number of ways that, that we need help. Um, I've gotten my vaccine guys. I got it Saturday. Um, uh, I got the J and J vaccine, my wife and I, and, um, knock on wood, uh, God bless. I was uh, fortunate. I had no soreness from the shot and it's been 48 hours plus and, uh, I haven't received any, uh, uh, I hadn't had a headache. I hadn't had any flu symptoms or anything like that. So uh, I'm happy that I was able to receive it, one and done. And I would encourage my fellow citizens out there, if you have an opportunity, uh, once you're eligible, please, please um, uh, go uh, take this vaccine. <clears throat> the other next item I have on Chairman's comments is, um, the um, finally, this guy's uh, Danny. I know we've finally come to fruition um, with the um, uh, Rodanthe uh, Sound launch area. Uh, we're going to end up closing the construction um, uh, for that area for a little bit of time. Um, that, uh, but I'm happy to report that um, it was announced. Uh, uh, at the end of, end of March, construction is going to start uh, April the 5th, um, and it's expected to take about 90 days, and it will remain closed uh, for an additional 60 days, just to allow time for the work on the um, uh, roadway and the parking lot uh, to be completed. Uh, it's going to be a two-lane um, boat dock with about 60-foot long floating center. If any of y'all familiar with Dock Street and Kill Devil Hills, it sounds like to me, Commissioner House is going to be very similar very close to, it. to that um, to that uh, boat ramp, and it is <laughs> it's first class. I mean, it is it is really nice. Um, and then there'll be it'll be about fourteen to sixteen parking spaces uh, for vehicles and boat trailers, and and um, it's going to be done in two phases. Phase one is going to be. Uh, the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, and then phase two will be contracted out. So um, finally, uh, glad to see this come to fruition, uh, Commissioner Couch. And I know the folks uh, down your way will uh, appreciate that as well. Um, just recently, um, Current TV um, released a video. If you hadn't had a chance to see it, uh, please do. It's uh, in partnership with the town of Manio, uh, honoring uh, Richard Etheridge in his uh, historic P. Island life-saving station. If you recall, we uh, we named the um, Lego Bridge, uh, wh whatever we called that at the time, uh, after him, in honor of him. And Current TV uh, is highlighting um, uh, his his life in the in the uh, uh, historic um, uh, life-saving station. Uh, the video is entitled Freedman Surfman Hero. And it's a, again, it's a story of Richard Etheridge and the P. Island life-saving uh, station. It tells a unique story uh, of the crew of the African-American surf surfmen who served their country at a time of immense uh, racial divide in this country. Um, Located in Roanoke, on Roanoke Island, North Carolina, P. Island Life Saving 
station was constructed in 1878. And in 1880, it became the first in the United States to be manned by an all African American crew surfman. Uh, the station was also the first in the nation to have African American um, man, Richard Etheridge, who was born a slave on Roanoke Island on January the 16th in 1842 as the station's keeper and commanding officer. I'm sure all of you are aware of the, the, the great history behind uh, that, um, uh, that crew. Uh, under his direction, the station was um, continually uh, regarded as one of the best on the entire eastern seaboard thanks to his remarkable crew and their efforts to save lives of hundreds of sailors who found themselves uh, in distress due to pearls of the graveyard of the Atlantic. In 1996, a hundred years after P. Island Life Saving Station crew, uh, historic October 11, 1896 rescue of the passengers and crew who were aboard the E.S. Newman, Newsman uh, when it ran aground off the coast of Roanoke during a hurricane, Etheridge and his all-black crew were posthumously awarded a gold <laughs> life-saving medal of honor by the United States Coast Guard for their courage and their dedication and their service uh, of that day. The story and legacy of Richard Etheridge and the P. Island Life Saver Station can be found on display at the P. Island Cookhouse Museum in Manio. And you can go to www.pislandpreservationsociety.com uh, to watch this story. Um, you know, go, go to that website and um, it'll be um, uh, posted there from uh, Current TV. So uh, if you have a chance, uh, please take the time. Uh, to um, uh, take a look at that. I know you will um, certainly certainly enjoy it. Um, Cooper, our, our governor, says group four shots now uh, move, moved up to March the 17th. Uh, and he announced this on March the 11th in a media briefing um, that members of, uh, of that uh, group four would be eligible for the COVID vaccination starting March the 17th. Among those in group four, just so you know, who are eligible um, are individuals 16 to 64 years old with high risk medical conditions that increase risk of severe disease from COVID, such as cancer, uh, COPD, serious heart conditions, uh, sickle cell, uh, disease and uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, group 4 in Dare County uh, uh, on uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, by Director Dr. Davies announced it was now, they were now accepting vaccination registrations for individuals in Group 4. The one difference between the counties and the states is that because Pfizer is the only vaccine approved for vaccinating 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds, and Dare County has not been getting the Pfizer vaccine. So our DHS uh, can only vaccinate those 18 and older with the uh, underlying high-risk uh, medical conditions. Anyone in group one through four uh, can go once again to www.darenc.com slash COVID vaccine and complete the uh, vaccination request form. So um, uh, if you fall in that category, once again, I strongly encourage you to uh, register for that. And then um, finally, I'm sure uh, a, a number of you have seen um, the, uh, we finally got some, uh, occupancy uh, results and some figures. Uh, uh, Commissioner Bateman, I know um, um, the uh, Business Bureau was waiting patiently to get those numbers. Um, and um, uh, some sections of the economy, I must admit, um, um, 
suffered uh, uh, considerable uh, COVID um, pandemic uh, issues with respects to opening up, especially our restaurants and, and other retail uh, locations uh, due, to, due to COVID uh, last year in 2020. But there were some that uh, uh, knocked it off the charts, and that's our um, um, rental uh, companies. Uh, they had record numbers um, in December of 2020. The op occupancy collections totaled about $11.3 million, uh, which was up 73% from December 2019, a total of $6.5 million. Uh, and even as recently as 2018, that number was only $4.8 million. That's huge. That is huge, um, and that's despite in spite of the fact that we were shut down for sixty days. So, so those numbers are off the chart. Um, uh, the occupancy revenues exceeded uh, from the second half of twenty nineteen by almost ninety million dollars um, in that in that particular industry. So, um, uh, I wish it was. Uh, is strong for our restaurants and our retail, but unfortunately it wasn't. But um, those numbers uh, were off the chart as far as rentals go. And with that, County Manager, uh, that ends my chairman's comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That brings us to public comment. Um, we're going to try a little something a little different this time, public comment. We're going to allow public comment by email as we've been doing, but we're also going to try to allow some people that have signed up previously when we put our notices out we ask people to sign up uh, and if they did we're going to call on them and try to get some live public comment for you all as well um, as with other public comment our public comment is going to be limited to three minutes um, we'll be i'm sorry five minutes we change that yeah. um, and so we'll be timing that and if, if we get close to five minutes i'll remind whoever's speaking that their time is just about up um, and so for those of you who are on the list um, when I call your name, it may take us a second for the technology to catch up, but we'll bring you on if you'll tell us your name again and then tell us where you're from, and then you're free to make public <clears throat> comment for five minutes. First on the list, I have Corey Bonner. Corey, are you on yet? Well, yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, if you tell us where you're from and then you start your public comment, please. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Corey Bonner. I'm a citizen of uh, Avon, North Carolina. I based and moved here last year. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to very quickly speak. Uh, kind of reviewed all the different pieces in the history of some of this stuff. But I'd, I'd like to ask three questions, really. Uh, one, has anybody from Dare County considered using the National Incident Management System, NIMS? Uh, the only reason I specifically point that out is Dare County's emergency response plan very clearly has overwash as one of the things that Dare County has to respond to. And um, it seems like the last time we, we talked about this, we weren't getting a lot of collaboration amongst, you know, state national park services or anything else like that. And um, really the second one really is, is, you know, it's going back and looking at the history with the other towns within Dare County, it doesn't seem to be an accurate representation to the citizens of Avon. Avon's a, Avon's a village basically caught between a national park and uh, a national seashore. So <clears throat> getting a little bit of back feed. Sorry about that. Is there anything that we can basically do that aligns Dare County and the national park system to basically come up with a more effective solution to taxing citizens for a beach and a, a road that we don't own? And I'll let, I'll let my comment expire there. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Timothy Caruso. Mr. Caruso is not on. All right. Next, we have Janet Freemuth. Janet's not on either. Next, we have Marianne Marshall. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please <laughs> okay. say your name and Thanks. tell us where you're from. Um, again, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to view this meeting and to be able to speak at the meeting. 
um, after the last meeting, I, I did become convinced that um, for the good of the community, something probably should be tried uh, to do the beach nourishment. And at the same time, I still have big concerns about District A and District B. Um, it just seems to me that that was drawn up in a pretty arbitrary and unfair way. Um, and uh, uh, comments that other people made last week um, pretty much solidified that opinion of mine. Uh, one woman said that Kinnicky Boulevard floods, when, which is on the west side of the Highway 12, when Ocean Isle Drive floods. And um, uh, somebody from north of uh, due east asked about what will happen when there's erosion at his oceanfront property. And I don't know if there's been any consideration for that down the road. Um, my property is, is five lots back from the oceanfront. I don't have a problem with flooding. And other than when there's rain, because my lot is low, um, I'm much closer to Highway 12. And it just seems unfair that I would be in a district A instead of a district B. And I'm hoping that there'll be consideration given to just having one district as there is in Buxton. And if that were the case, then I would definitely feel like as a part of the community there, I should make a contribution. Um, I did the math to see what my increase would be in my taxes, and it would actually be a 45% increase. And that's a lot. Um, so I, the, our, our property has been in my family since 1975, and my grandchildren are the fourth generation to enjoy time there. And we love Avon, and um, I guess that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Roger Lambert. Uh, there. Do we have anybody else, Matt? Okay. Daniel Twining, are you on? Daniel what? Twining. Yes, hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please tell us your name and where you're from, please. Yeah, hi, Daniel Twining. We're beachfront owners uh, in Avon on Bartlett Lane. We just strongly support the proposal for beach replenishment, and we just appreciate the commission's good work. Obviously, saving the beach is essential to the entire community, and uh, we are willing to pay our fair share. So I just wanted to offer a vote of support and to thank you all for the extraordinary uh, diligence and work that's gone into us. I understand it's tough. No one wants their taxes raised, uh, but some things are worth paying for, uh, at least until there's a more permanent solution. So thank you all. Thank you. Dominic Ross, are you on? Mr. Ross? Our, our show that you're self-muted, Mr. Ross. Could you unmute yourself? I have this irresistible urge to ask his question, answer his question. He keeps asking for Mr. Ross. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, That's still muted, Matt. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. Ross, we can't get you on, so we're going to move to the next. Anybody else, Matt? I can't hear you. Perk. Roberto. Hello. Perk. Are you on? Yeah, I'm on. Please, Hello? please tell us your name. We we couldn't understand it. So if you tell us your name, name where you're from. Pierce. I'm a Navy veteran. I now reside in the area. And I have one question because I'm doing a research on the county. And I would like if you'd be able to provide me information as a source, if that is okay with you guys. Sure, we don't, this is public comment. We don't answer questions or debate in public comment. So if you have questions, you can contact us online or whatever. We'll be glad to answer your questions, but we don't answer questions during public comment. So what do we do during public comment? 
Do you have anything to address the board with? Okay. Anyone else? Ray Hollowell. Uh, okay. Ray Hollowell. Mr. Hollowell, are you on? Mr. Hollowell? Is he muted? Mr. Hollowell, we're not hearing you on our end. Are you there? All right. Anyone else, Matt? Cynthia Morgan, are you on? You're you're muted, I think. Could you unmute yourself, Miss Morgan? Uh, Ms. Morgan, are you on? Yeah. All right, if you'd tell us your name and where you're from, please. Cynthia Morgan. Uh, I'm just watching. And, uh, Cannot understand her, Bobby. But you're going to need to either get closer to your mic. We can barely hear you. Uh, okay, just supporting the podcast, that's all. I say technology is the answer. Yes. Are you there? Yes, I'm supporting. You, there's something going on on your end with your mic because we're not hit, picking you up on our end. Move to the next. That's it. That's all that we have for public comment, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, County Manager. <laughs> uh, and with that, we'll move to item three on the agenda. Uh, this is a, a broadband presentation from Derek Kelly with the Government Affairs Director of Lumen Technologies. Lumen Technologies is the successor to CenturyLink. Um, this agenda item was prompted by some discussions that and some work that Commissioner Overman's doing for the last few months, trying to figure out broadband in Dare County, where our problems were, what our uh, issues are, and then what our solutions are. And in doing his homework and going through that work, he uh, had a conversation with Mr. Kelly, who volunteered to come and sort of give you an overview and give you some discussions about where broadband stands and, and sort of what we can do in the future. Uh, I think I said that right, Commissioner Overman, is that correct? And with, with that said, we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Kelly, and I think he's got a PowerPoint, and he's going to take you all through it. Welcome, Mr. Thank Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, sir. It looks like I am sharing the wrong screen. Hang on one second. I apologize for that. Are you able to see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. I apologize. I'm going to try to flip everything real quick. But thank you for the opportunity tonight. Um, and thank you, uh, Chairman Over or Commissioner Overman, for reaching out to us. Lumen, we did uh, we did change the name of our parent company a couple months ago, uh, but we are still operating under the CenturyLink brand for our consumer and small business areas. So Lumen um, is more of our enterprise business that sort of spans 60 countries, uh, but you'll still see our trucks and our CenturyLink employees in your local market. But they uh, had us all change our email signatures just to confuse everyone a little bit. So I'm going to try to quickly just go through um, how I see state of broadband in Dare County, talk a little bit about the FCC's latest announcement, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, talk about the state's broadband grant program called the Great Grant or Growing uh, Rural Economies with Access to Technology, talk about some of the challenges 
we face in Dare County and then just open it up for any questions. So this is a, a snapshot of the FCC's broadband map and how I have it filtered right now is showing any areas that have access to 25 by three service. So that's 25 megabits coming into your home and three megabytes coming out of your home. Derek, so when you think of me, yes. Could you take one moment for some of us that may not have a frame of reference that 25 in and three out is good or bad, high or low, and what it might be comparable to, so we have a little bit better feel, if you could. Absolutely, so if you think, the, the two easiest ways I define it is if you think about a Netflix video, if you're watching it at high definition, you need about five or six megs of download speed to coming into your house to get that service. So when you think about a 25 meg connection, Theoretically, you could watch four, four Netflix movies at the same time. Now, when we think about this uh, go-to webinar or if the students are using Google Meet or Microsoft Teams, all the different video platforms, most of them will say you need about six to eight megabits of download speed to watch the other stream, and then you need about two megs of upload to upload your video so other people can see you. So if you would have asked me 13 months ago, if I thought um, 10 megs down, that used to be the standard the FCC went by, closed the homework gap, I would have said, yes, a 10 meg download speed would have closed the homework gap. Students can do the research. You can watch a Netflix video. You may not be able to watch multiple at the same time, but you could more or less do all the homework that you need to do. You know, fast forward to the pandemic and sending all of our students home and many of our employees home, <laughs> 10 by one connection really isn't cutting it for that environment. You might be able to have one session going on with okay video, but for the families that have more than one student at home or if a parent's trying to do this while the student's in the next room, you're really gonna struggle. And 25 by three is really the, the table stakes for being able to have multiple sessions like this going on in, in the household. So when you see this map, if you see the green areas, that's showing you where there's at least one provider offering 25 meg and three meg of upload in those census blocks. If you see a couple of spots where you see more, sort of a darker shade, that means there's more than one company, but it's available in that area. And so one of the challenges the FCC map has is that if one home in a census block has service, that entire census block is served. So if you think of the these large census blocks that are down around Stumpy Point, if there's one house in this big block that has service, that gets served or shows as served. The FCC recently put out an order to improve the maps, um, not the latest round of stimulus or um, pandemic relief bill that just was signed by the president, but the one before that actually gave the FCC the funds they need to get the next generation of maps out there that'll be much more location-based. Uh, but the idea or the example I always give is, if you plug in an address, say on Highway 264, it's a very long highway and you can be driving down the road and your GPS will say one mile to your destination and then you drive right by the building two seconds later. It's because there's issues with geocoding and knowing exactly where every home is actually located. The FCC has the framework now in place, and we hope to have much more accurate maps in about 12 to 18 months. So if I zoom in, because it's a little hard to see, here's a closer view of the areas that are showing as not having service in Dare County. Are you getting feedback on your end? We're good. We're good. Okay. So basically it's showing everywhere around East Lake, is unserved and if I zoomed in really far you would see there's one census block around Stumpy Point that's unserved. P Island shows is unserved although I don't think there's any homes until you get in down into Rodanthe. The same thing around Juan Chain. there's a couple blocks that show unserved and, uh, and a lot of the land around the Alligator uh, Wild Refuge but I don't see many homes located in there. And so the biggest the areas I see are the ones that I'm going to get into in the, the next map. So this is uh, the FCC issued or awarded auction winners back in December, what's called the RDOF or Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. 
So the program kicks off in 2022 or the funding mechanism and it's a sticker build out. But CenturyLink won the auction to provide service to every home. So the big areas you see down around East Lake, there's one more census block down along the county border and then there's one census block in and around Stumpy Point. The grant or the um, final applications for the, the program were actually just put into the FCC in late January. So we're very early on in the process. But basically by us winning this auction, we're gonna bring gigabit speeds of fiber to the home for every one of the locations, whether they be homes or small businesses in all of these census blocks. It is a six year build out program. It's not to say we're gonna take six years to build out to every one of those. It could be that they get built in year one. It could be that they're in a later year. We'll know that as we get a little bit closer time frame. we'll start getting some year by year um, projections on where we're going to build, but there's some milestones that we have to hit throughout that program. So the North Carolina um, General Assembly started up the GREAT program about two years ago, but we've gone through three rounds. So the first round was in 2019, and that was only opened up to tier one counties of the state. And then last year, we ended up having a, a regular round of grade, and then the General Assembly ended up appropriating an extra $30 million to have a supplemental round. And when they did that, they opened it up to tier two counties. So when, when you look at that program, Right now, the definition of, of unserved is any areas that have less than 25 and three, but then the round that happened last year, there was a little caveat that said at least 90% of your projects should be homes that don't have <laughs> access to 10 one service. So if we look at a Dare County map, just looking census block by census block, this is how it currently looks. Now I've done a quick review overlaying that previous map I showed you of what areas we're gonna build with RDOF and this map and remove some of the shading so I could actually see if there was homes. And while it looks like there's, oops, while it looks like there's a lot of green, most of that green is either water um, or census blocks that didn't have a, any homes or businesses located in them. Did a zoom in of that and same thing. So all the blocks and all the homes I could see up around East Lake were gonna be part of our RDOF application. There's one census block down at the very bottom. And there you can see, if you have good eyes, you can see the one little green census block um, that we've committed to serve now. When we get down to serve that census block, um, there's only about five or six homes in there. I would assume we will end up uh, placing fiber to the homes to some of the surrounding homes, but it's a little too early in the construction project to know if we're going to do that or not. So I'll pause there and open it up for any questions. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Overman. Uh, really appreciate you uh, coming down and, and talking about this today. Um, I, I know you don't have any feel for time. Do, do you have any idea as to uh, when you will start to put together what your plans are uh, from a timing standpoint? I'm hoping by the end of the year, we'll have at least a tentative time frame of what we're anticipating to do for at least the first few years. And I, 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 oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and what kind of help can, can uh, I think you mentioned early on, what kind of help can counties uh, who, are, who are needing this service, which obviously we are, uh, what can counties do to help out uh, through the uh, RDOF or the, or the GREAT program? A supplement so, thank that. you. I skipped over that. So with the RDOF program, nothing comes to mind right now. Um, you know, all the permitting and stuff that we normally go through, all of our engineers are used to dealing with all the, the DOT uh, districts that are responsible for helping us with those permits. When it comes to the great grant, one of the challenges we face when you look at a county like there, where it looks like, especially when you get over to Manio, Juan Cheese, and everywhere along the beach, it appears that cable service has service to every single home in those areas. That's not necessarily the case. So if you are hearing complaints 
that access is not available in some of those areas, feel free to funnel them to me. That's one of the best things that help with right now is helping us identify if there are so unserved pockets in the areas that look like they're served. And then if that is the case, we're able to identify some areas of the county where they're unserved that we're able to put in an application through the grade program. One of the things that counties can do, which helps give additional points in the scoring system is to come in and partner with the provider. So last year we um, had three counties that basically contributed 10% of our required match. So for that round, CenturyLink had to provide 30% of the funding for the program. So the county essentially had to provide 3% of the overall project. <coughs> and that allowed us to get extra partnership status in all three of our projects that had partners who ended up being funded. So, so in other words, if you get partial funding uh, through RDOF or, or uh, GREAT program, then, uh, and, and that's 70%, and that leaves you with 30%, then whatever the percentage is left, the, the counties that uh, come in to partner with you pay 10% of that, of your amount, right? Correct. Uh, that's the minimum required for the partnership status. Now, um, you know, when we run through an internal business case, it's not to say that we wouldn't need something larger than that, but that's the minimum amount. And that's all we asked for for those three counties last time is enough to get that partnership status and pretty much cement that we would get those projects funded because the, um, the state wants to incentivize working with our, our localities uh, when it comes to the grant program. As far as RDOF, that funding or that does not require any additional funding from the county. So that's, we've committed to, to get the support from the FCC and to deploy those services. So we don't need anything above and beyond to serve those areas of uh, East Lake or down around Stumpy Point. Right. Well, well, do counties who partner with you have a, um, I'll, I'll say it the only way I know how to say it. Uh, if, if a county partners with you, will they get preferential treatment over counties who do not partner with you? Talking about from the state's perspective or from our, our perspective? I'm talking about from your perspective as it relates to time. Um, when it comes to the great grant, definitely if there's counties that are interested in doing that, we will definitely make sure we do a deep dive and, and work with you versus um, you know, we're going through right now, we have a list of about 23 counties that we're trying to review. We serve about 68 counties um, in North Carolina. We've narrowed that down to 23 that we want to try at least doing some level of review on. We have Dare County in that list right now because of this conversation. So the, the county showing an interest in reaching out to us definitely helps with, with making sure it's on the radar. And if we know that the county could be interested in, in helping financially with that, you know, definitely puts it near the top of the list. Uh, you, you showed uh, East Lake on the mainland <coughs> as um, an RDOF. That, that's what you got the, the bid on, correct? Correct. Yeah, and and you don't require any help with that. But based on the, the, the balance of the county, uh, how do you ascertain an estimate as to how much that's going to ultimately be versus uh, great grant money that's available for those areas? Well, and that's where we're struggling to even find any additional areas because everywhere else we've looked is either showing that they're served by the cable company um, or by us. And that's where if the county, if you are hearing from constituents other than in that East Lake area that, that they don't have access to service, if, if you can help with funneling that information to me, then we can do some extra due diligence to check those areas out. Um, but otherwise, when we look up and down um, Hatteras Island and up through Nags Head, Kitty Hawk, all those areas, and even Manio and, and Juan Cheese, it appears like everywhere is covered by the cable company. And if that's not the case, we're happy to, to dig into any areas if you're aware of them. Yeah, well, we are having conversation with the cable folks as well uh, as to how uh, that can potentially be a partnership with them too to reach these underserved areas. And... Um, that that's just part of the, the the whole package that we're looking at here, um, and and 
that was why the, uh, the the contact was made with you all to see what your timing was. We don't really feel like we have six years, quite honestly. Uh, I personally have been on uh, a 10 meg maximum for 10 years, probably. It's been a long time. And uh, I know there's a lot of other folks in the county that's the same way. Uh, on the on your website, it shows that uh, town of Manio gets like 30 or 40 megs if you're in the, in the town. And uh, certainly appreciate the fact that everything you do going forward is going to be fiber optic and you're going to offer uh, one gig of service in that. And that's outstanding. Uh, but we just we just kind of up against it time wise here with the uh, with the folks, uh, particularly COVID has has exacerbated that, as you know, and uh, we just we're just trying to get moving on it in any way that we can uh, potentially help. Uh, that that's that's the reason for the questions to find out, uh, start getting some estimates on uh, on what our part would be to partner with you, but where where necessary. Absolutely, and I believe there's been some conversations going on at, at Congress about different ways to try speeding up the timelines. Um, maybe coming up with some type of incentives if, if providers are able to beat that timeline. So that's still a, to be determined. But as I get more information, happy to, to continue to reach out and just update everyone with, with the status of those projects. The, I don't know if it's the good or the bad. We were not as successful in North Carolina with the RDOF auction as, as I would have liked. Um, so really, we only have projects in two counties. There's milestones that we have to hit throughout the years and if we have to hit a certain number of households in each um, in each year and we only have two counties, one would lead me to believe that we could end up doing one county one year and another county another year. Um, but it's until we actually get the plans from our planning and our finance team, I, I can't give you the definitive timeline. Is, is your, are, are your milestones uh because I know you you had uh, bids all across the nation. Uh, are, are your milestones um, just based on a number of households, no matter what state it's in? I mean, is that a is that a nationwide milestone? I actually asked that same question of today, and I haven't gotten an answer back yet. When the last round of funding was called the Connect America Fund, and we had to hit that milestone on a per state basis and I'm not sure if RDOF is set up the same way or if it's going to be a nationwide um, uh, milestone. Uh, did I understand you to say that, that there are only two counties in North Carolina that you were successful with RDOF bids? Correct. It was uh, Dare County and I think Scotland County. Okay. So so if it comes down as a as a state by state deal, then we're in pretty good shape, I would think. I would tend to believe that's an accurate statement. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Anyone else have any questions of, of uh, yeah, Derek? Yeah, I, I did, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Hey, Derek, thank you very much. This is Rob Ross again. Uh, I got a little tangled and confused. You were describing that other than East Lake, everywhere in Derek County has service. And Vice Chairman Oberman was explaining that for years, he's been under 10. So I'm trying to get a grip on what would be the cost if I had a magic wand to provide 25 by three service to all of Dare County? Do we know that number? And so, and I, I believe uh, Commissioner Overman is in the East Lake community, right? No, no, I'm on Roanoke Island. He's on Roanoke Island. Okay, and do you have access to Spectrum? Yes. Okay. And so that, that's why um, his area is showing is served, which would make it ineligible for the great grant. So if Spectrum has service there, I think their starting speed is, is 200 megs down and 10 megs up. So based, or in some areas, it may be 100 by 5 or something like that. They Those start, areas would not be eligible for the grant program. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now I'm confused again. You must have 100 by 5, Wally, not under 10. No, I don't, I don't have... I don't have a uh, cable. He, he doesn't have. So, so let me cl clarify then. If everybody in Dare County had access but declined cable, do we have broadband or don't we? Well, you would have. If they have. They, they if have. They have one, they started available 100. to you. They Those census blocks uh, uh, are served, and it would make them ineligible for the grant programs. Yeah. See, I'm trying to separate between 
there's broadband access and you've chosen not to get cable to access it versus there is no cable, there is no access, whether you wanted it or not. And I'm quite frankly confused by the two. If you no. have if you have access to cable, yes, sir. You can get they start at one hundred. I think it goes one hundred, three hundred, four hundred, or one hundred, two hundred, four hundred, something like that, in speed. So you could, in essence, switch to cable if you wanted to, and have at least that much speed. Okay. This is the this is the phone company. Okay. which pretty much everybody has okay. uh, access to. In okay. my particular case, I'm on a DSL system, and 10 megs is the highest that it offers. Um, Derek just mentioned that, that, that 25 these days is basically considered a, a, a minimum, just a, a, a bare minimum, but their decision has been that any uh, uh, new... I'm trying to find the right words, that anything that they do going forward is going to be all optic and it's going to provide one gigabyte of service going forward. All right. For the, for the very first grant round, we did a couple of DSL projects. But the issue with DSL is the further away from our equipment is the slower your speeds are. So in order for us to do a 25 by 3 service, you have to be within about 3,500 feet of our equipment. So if we were going to go and build in a new area, if we have to get fiber within 3,500 feet of you and we can only provide 25 meg out to 3,500 feet, it ends up being a better long-term investment for us to just go ahead and place fiber to every single one and have gigabit speed. And one of the struggles we have in the areas where we already have service is we charge the same price whether you can get 10 meg or 100 meg today. And then if you want gigabit service, we charge about $15 more. And so it creates a challenging business environment for us to go and overbuild where we already have some level of speed. So, you know, in areas of Manio, we have, I think we have 40 and maybe some 80 meg areas. Um, and then it goes down depending how far you are from our equipment. Well, if we were to go and overlay all those areas with fiber, the home, most of our customers, I'd say probably 75% of our existing customers would switch over to it and pay us the exact same amount of money. And then you'd have about 25% of the customers might pay us an extra $15. So it's one of the challenges we face with our existing areas and we're focusing more on the areas that don't have service or have service of less than 10 megs where we can apply for a grant to try helping those areas. So, Derek, with the, with the getting back to what you just said, do, do areas that have the 10 meg service right now qualify for any great grant money? They do, as long as they. So, if we are the only provider there and we have 10 meg today, yes, they qualify for the grant program. Okay, and you're and you're if, trying to ask them, the, the legislature, to go up to 25 on that, also, right? Correct, because right now the definition moved to 25 and 3, but they still want at least 90% of your application to be um, below 10 meg. So that's what we're requesting to either remove that 90% threshold or at least make it where it might be like a 50-50 difference or something where the state is still giving some preference to the areas because there are areas of our state that still have zero meg today yeah. um, for many provider and that's where some of the legislators still want to make sure we're focusing on those areas and not losing sight of them. Um, but when you get into these rural areas, if you look at all the grants that have been giving out, plus all the FCC stuff, the areas without service are becoming smaller and smaller if you only look at the areas less than 10 megs. So if you can broaden it and look at some areas that maybe have 10 or 20 meg with those zero meg areas, you can create a bigger project that has more economies of scale. Um, but for the example in Manio, if CenturyLink has 10 meg service to a house today, but Spectrum also offers service, even if the customer doesn't want that Spectrum service, we wouldn't be able to go after grant dollars because Spectrum is already there. Derek, Derek Irvin Bateman here. Um, so if my understanding is correct, East Lake and Stumpy Point, neither one have Spectrum? 
uh, from what I can see, Stumpy Point has some service, but they are just missing that one census block for whatever reason. It got lumped in the FCC's um, definition. But when I looked at the rest of the area around the water there, it looked like the rest of them, the rest of the homes had access to Spectrum. And how about East Lake? Uh, I do not see any Spectrum up there. Okay. I think they they only go into Juan Cheese, and I don't think they go any further in the mainland until you're over in uh, Washington or Hyde. Okay, the, the reason I was asking, uh, in one of your previous maps, you had um, different colors of green, and some was almost a blue. I noticed that Kitty Hawk was more of a blue instead of the green color. Is that where Spectrum is there? Is that what the different colors with that slide were? So if you see the darker shade, that means both us and Spectrum have um, faster than 25 by 3 speeds. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that is that I've had numerous calls from folks in the Kitty Hawk landing area, which is on the uh, western point of the village, um, that their students were having a hard time. They were losing between the, the classes and all kinds of stuff on the point out there. And um, they have cable service with Spectrum. And I just, um, if they have a spectrum there and they have that many megabytes, I don't understand why they would be losing service. It, it probably comes down to an operational question. It, I think someone mentioned that you have spectrum lined up to come speak, but if you need a contact with them, I can, I can relate to some of my peers with them. Um, but if, if we were to go after a grant area for one of those, they could basically say to the state, no, we have access to those speeds here. Um, and they would basically kick those areas out of our grant application, which is why we we try to do our best due diligence to make sure we never apply for areas where they have service today. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> well, Derek, thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to address the board. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. County manager. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> that brings us to item four on the agenda. That's the discussion for the uh, tax service district <clears throat> name on. Um, you all are at the presentation, so I'm not going to go back through all that history and all that again. But where we are now is we're at a point where if we're going to do this and we think we're going to do this, then we've got to start a process to create the tax service district. There's a statutory process for that. Uh, we have to send out some notices. We have to send out some maps. We have to do some publications. We have to have a public hearing. We have to do all those things. And so really, I, when it says on there, approve the tax service district and all that on your agenda sheet, that's really not what we're doing because you're, you're not, you can't see set the tax rate when you approve your budget uh, and you'll create the tax district once all of the stuff that I've got to do uh, under the statute gets done that would then allow you to, to create the district. So that all comes down the road. What I need tonight is your approval for me to begin that process, um, which, you know, that means it appears we're going to move forward with some kind of a project. And if we are, then we've got to start the process to create that district to pay for it. And so I need to know whether or not to begin that process. Um, you will come back later to have a vote on actually putting the district in place once I've done all the things on the checklist and you'll come back later in the budget process when you approve the tax rate for the county and everything else you also at that time would approve the tax rate for the tax service district so there's at least two more votes that you'd have to do uh, before any of this becomes final um, so what I'm looking for tonight is whether to move forward with that process or not um, if we're going to do it our window is closing it takes about 60 days to do it and it means we would have to do it get all that done so that you'd be in a position to approve it when you approve the budget at the end of may or first of june so we're we've got enough time we got plenty of time but we don't have an inordinate amount of time i move to authorize county manager to proceed okay um there's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Ross, but I want to make sure the motion is clear in that 
we're authorizing the county manager to begin the process to establish an Avon service district. Is that correct? That, that, that's what that's you're what looking I mean. for. Yes, sir. And that's, that's, uh, that's the motion you intend, correct, Commissioner Ross? Correct. Okay. Is I'll there, pardon? I'll second it. Is a seconded by that motion by, by Commissioner Tobin. The floor is open for discussion. Okay, hearing no discussion then, um, those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. All right, Mr. Chairman, that brings us to item five on the agenda. That's a proclamation establishing April 2021 as North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month. Okay, thank you, uh, County Manager. Um, just for the board's point um, um, NC811 Safe Digging Month is in its 43rd year of service to the citizens of uh, North Carolina. Um, North Carolina One Call System is known as this NC811 and it's uh, a very vital part of preventing damages and injuries when uh, excavating. Uh, the fast and easiest communication link with your local utility providers, they started this in, in uh, 1978. And the law requires that anyone engaged in demolition or excavation activities needs to contact NC811 at least three days um, prior to beginning the work. <coughs> that will allow the facility operators to have those full three working days to make um, uh, mark the facility, the, the uh, facilities. So uh, I'm reminding everyone out there in public that does this, uh, remember to call 811. It's also important after a storm uh, to prevent potential injuries as well. So I'm going to ask the county manager at this time to uh, read the proclamation. This is a proclamation proclaiming April 2021 as North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month. Whereas utility owners, excavators, designers, and homeowners work to keep pace with North Carolina's economic development, it is important to minimize damages to underground utility lines, dangers to workers and to the general public, environmental impact, and loss of utility services to the citizens of North Carolina. And whereas North Carolina 811 a utility service notification center and leader in education celebrates its 43rd year of continuous service to the state is key to preventing injuries and damages when excavating. And whereas this unique service provides easy one call notification about construction and excavation projects that may endanger workers and jeopardize utility lines while promoting workplace and public safety, reducing underground utility damage, minimizing utility service interruptions and protecting the environment. And whereas this vital service, which began in 1978, served the citizens of North Carolina from the mountains to the coast, educates stakeholders about the need for excavation safety, whether the project is as small as planting a tree, to de designing and beginning construction on a new interstate. And whereas in 2020, the North Carolina One Call System received 2.1 million notification requests and transmitted over 12.2 million requests providing protection to utility companies' infrastructure, their employees, excavators, and customers. Now, therefore, be it resolved, we, the Dare County Board of Commissioners, designate the month of April 2021 as North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month to encourage all excavators and homeowners of Dare County to contact 811 either by dialing 811 or contacting NC811 via the webpage of nc811.org at least three day, at least three working days prior to digging in order to know what's below. Avoid injury, protect the environment, prevent millions of dollars in damage, and to remind excavators that three working days notice is the law for safe digging is no accident and more information may be obtained by visiting www.nc811.org this the 15th day of March, 2021. Move to adopt the property. Proclamation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner House. Commissioner House made the motion to adopt the proclamation. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Bateman. Are those, uh, the floor is open for discussion. 
Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, Chairman, item six is a public health proclamation from the Health and Human Services called Take Down Tobacco Day 2021. I think we have a video for that. are five times more likely to have COVID-19 related symptoms. On average, a smoker's life expectancy is 10 years less than non-smokers. seven times more likely to get COVID. our Dare County Board of Commissioners to help us take down the back this proclamation on April 1st, 2021. Mr. Chairman, I have a proclamation. It's called Take Down Tobacco Day. Whereas traditional cigarette usage in teens has been on a downward trend over the past decade, Smoking overall has been on an upward trend due to the emergence of a new product, an electronic cigarette. These products are more commonly referred to as e-cigarettes and or jewels. Whereas these products are easily accessible to the youth population, come in a variety of flavors and at an, and at an extremely low cost. The lack of a distinct smell and the inconspicuous nature of the devices make them easy to conceal. Therefore, their use often goes unnoticed. Whereas according to information provided by the Centers for Disease Control, the number of high schoolers who are smoking actively at least once a day is on the rise. And over the past two years, the number of students that have developed a smoking habit has more than <coughs> doubled with nine out of 10 cigarette smokers starting the habit by the age of 18. And whereas, whereas although our community has also seen an increase in smokers, mainly in the high school age, middle schoolers still present a cause for concern. And whereas the Dare County Health, Depart Health and Human Services Department has provided education, spread awareness, and offered intervention links for our youth population, the use of electronic cigarettes continues to present a challenge to the health and well-being of our youth population. Whereas Dare County has been proactive in responding to, to this challenge by prohibiting the use of electronic cigarettes in restaurants and bars, this primarily targets adults in our community. And whereas Dare County needs to acknowledge the problem that we currently face with tobacco use among our youth, 
and encourage our community to focus attention on e-cigarette use in young people. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Dare County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the day of April 1st, 2021 as Take Down Tobacco Day and call upon the people of Dare County to increase their awareness and understanding of the problems we face regarding tobacco use amongst our youth. This is the 15th day of March, 2021. Mr. Chairman, at the top of our agenda every week, how will these decisions impact our children and families? We just saw a video where our children here in Dare County are asking for this proclamation. <coughs> I so move this proclamation. All right. Thank you, Commissioner House. Is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Tobin. Floor is open for any discussion. Yeah, I, I have a question. Yes, sir, Commissioner Ross. I was quite impressed with the students in that video. I am equally impressed with the message they're promoting. I am slightly less impressed and or distressed by what I frequently see in media as far as the promotion of advancing the expansion, legalization, and use of marijuana. And I'm wondering, it just occurred to me as I was watching these great kids in this campaign, which I fully and support, is there an equally ambitious, aggressive, and demonstrative campaign to make sure any advancing of other intoxicants, especially with what I have seen broad scale elsewhere in the country, the legalization of marijuana. Uh, and I'm looking kind of at county manager. I don't know that you would know that or not, Bobby. I just thought I wanted to ask the question. I don't know. This, I would, this I would power do. peer group that yeah. is doing that. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, if not maybe three years ago, I did a presentation in front of this board about the use of marijuana and 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 uh, trying to put that at bay as well. That's what I'm basically so, looking yeah. for a partner yeah. initiative or resolution saying mm -hmm. we're on board here and we're on board on this other. You know, it's because right. I keep seeing these again. Maybe I'm selective media watcher. I don't know. But there seems to be this growing acceptance. It's it's fine, guys. Why shouldn't you know, fourteen year olds be smoking marijuana? It's fine. It's not fine. So anyway, I was just dis I was disturbed by that, but highly encouraged by this. <laughs> okay, we have a motion on the floor, and it's been seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. That brings us to item seven on the agenda for a while. <laughs> How long has it been, Dorothy? Dorothy's been working for a long time on social media policy because we don't have a Facebook page and all that for the county. And for most of that time, she's been working to convince me that that's the direction that we ought to have been going. Um, Caitlin has been on board now for how long? Four or five months. And she's devoted a lot of time to that too. And so we've had some meetings and we're going to move forward with trying to do, to improve our social media presence through all of the social media mechanisms. Our goal is to have a way to communicate and people seem to communicate that way and we need to get our information out. And so they have developed a social media policy. They've been working on it for a while. We've been through several versions and this is the version that they would ask you to adopt. Um, I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Dorothy and Caitlin and, and they can take you through this. Good evening, Ms. Hester. Good evening, commissioners. I guess I need to take my mask off. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this proposed policy this evening. Um, it's something, as, as the county manager said, we've been talking about it for quite a while now. And... Um, I'm just excited to bring it forward for your consideration. Caitlin um, Kite is our PR specialist here with me tonight, and she has an essential role in developing and overseeing not only our website, but also our social media. Um, our other team member, Stephanie Banfield, she's not here tonight. She's our PR coordinator, but she also has a role and would help develop content and to monitor the, the website and the social media. Um, let me get my, we, you may ask, why is this necessary? Um, the current policy that's in place 
is almost a decade old. It was adopted in 2012, so nine years ago. And we know that a lot has changed since then. It's estimated that back then about 45% of people were on social media. That number today is about 72%. And most everyone that's on there is getting their news that way. That's how people get news. I know y'all have, have heard that. Um, social media is a critical component for effective communications. It can be used for all types of messaging. Um, safety and emergency, certainly we think of it in that way, but also for things such as job recruitment, special events, and just to share general information about all of our different departments and services, because there are a lot of them and some people are quite unfamiliar with all that we do. We do have a presence on Facebook. We actually, um, our individual departments, that's the approach that we took when we first developed our social media, media policy. But there is a need for some general county government accounts so that we can consolidate the messaging and ensure consistency. So in thinking about the broad mission of all our departments and our audiences, diverse audiences and our unique geography, the social media tools really are ideal for connecting with our citizens. Those who live here, those who own property here, and even those who, who enjoy visiting. You might ask about what's new. Um, the newest part is that this policy is very condensed. Our last policy was nine pages. This one is four. So we deleted a lot. At that time, there were a lot of details for each different platform. So we've really just cleaned it up um, and, and made it more concise and more condensed. Um, so the website is our primary communications tool. And the social media tools would continue to serve as our secondary platforms for communicating. And the primary purposes really do remain the same. So we just would like to disseminate emergency information quickly, promote county sponsored events, activities, services, and other news and then always try to refer everyone back to the content that we have on the website. So what social media channels are included in the policy? They remain the same. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Flickr are the five that we have, and those would stay in place. And just to give you an overview of what we have, um, our existing accounts, we have 10 Facebook accounts. Um, I guess I can go through those. Three are Parks and Rec, each division. Probably need to put my glasses on so that I can. We have the Baum Center, the Dare County Center, the Sheriff's Department, the Airport, the Library, Health and Human Services, and Current TV. Those are the 10 existing pages. We have three Twitter accounts a general Dare County, an emergency management and current TV, two YouTube accounts, the Dare County government, which is where we're live streaming tonight, and then one for current TV. And the only Instagram account is for current TV. So that's what we have in place now. Dorothy, mm -hmm. um, on Facebook, you mentioned 10. I'm looking at this document. I'm missing one. Um, do you have that available? The Fessenden Center. What are we missing? The Fessenden Center, is that what we're missing? You, I think you're missing in there either the sheriff's or the airport. Yeah, I don't see airport or sheriff one there, so that's probably what it is. The Fessenden and the um, Parks and Rec serve as one in the same. Oh, okay. We'll get that updated. We've made a few edits right. to this policy since we put it in the packet. And that was one of the things I was going to mention to you. Okay. But there are 10. Okay. We looked at that closely today to make sure we had that accurate. We are proposing two new accounts. Um, they would be general Dare County accounts. One would be Facebook 
and one would be Instagram. And I believe, and I think hopefully the county manager now agrees, that having these general accounts would enable us to um, be more innovative and engaging with our social media. And in also enable departments, there are a lot of departments that don't have a social media presence. And by having some general accounts, they'll have a presence. I think of EMS. At one time, they thought about starting a Facebook account. But once they thought about it, they didn't have really that much to post. But that's where we can fill some gaps and have a, help those who don't have a presence to have one. So, um, and, and eventually, I'm going to be quite honest, there are some that exist that don't post a lot and that don't have many followers. So down the road, we'd also like to consolidate and maybe some that don't need it could work into the pages that we're creating. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin and she's going to share details about guidelines for publishing and monitoring. And then we'll open up for questions. Okay. Good evening, Caitlin. Good evening. Thank you very much for listening to us, commissioners. Um, as Dorothy mentioned, we currently have the 10 Facebook accounts right now, the most active of which is the Dare County Department of Health and Human Services. And this page actually grew from 1,318 followers on March 1st of last year to 11,998 followers on March 1st of this year. Wow, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> it does, <Yeah. laughs> doesn't it? That is an almost 10,000 follower increase, and that is because it became such a vital tool for rapidly disseminating information regarding the pandemic. Um, this tells us that social media is a viable means of communicating with our residents and property owners and that we should be utilizing it. We would like to build a Dare County Government Facebook page and a Dare County Government Instagram account in order to serve as general platforms for distributing information <laughs> about safety and education within the county. Um, some of the information we'd like to share is public works collection schedule disruptions and revisions, county project updates, such as the Dare County COA campus, updates on the construction of that progress would be great to share on that platform hurricane and evacuation notices because social media is such a great tool for getting information out quickly and rapidly to our community. Parks and recreation program information, signing up for different activities. Same thing with the Balm Center, Fesden Center, and Dare County Center. And then finally, various notices and educational information from all of our departments, from the tax department, the water department, soil and water conservation. All of them have great educational information that we can use right now. So the content posted to the Deer County government accounts will provide unique perspectives on departmental programs and services, but there will also be guidelines and restrictions in place. Posts should always be factual and meaningful. When possible, as Dorothy mentioned, the content that we post on our social media accounts We'll link back to our website to get people to the accurate information and more information. And then finally, with the exception of approved share posts from some of our other official sources, all the content and images must be the original work and property of Dare County. Getting into who will manage the accounts, um, social media performance and analytics should always, oops, I think I skipped the page guys, sorry about that. <laughs> The Public Relations Department currently manages the Dare County Government Twitter account, and we also oversee all the other Dare County accounts. Um, I will have primary responsibility for posting content on the Dare County Government Facebook and Instagram accounts and continue to monitor all the other pages, along with Stephanie and Dorothy. We will also create a schedule and a post bank. Um, we'll fill this up with educational information and plan it out for the month ahead of time. That way we can consistently post and ensure that we're posting a minimum of three times per week to keep our audience engaged. Now into the posting performance and analytics. Um, it's very vital to measure the analytics and the performance of your Facebook page for three reasons to understand who we are reaching, to ensure that the proper medium is being used, it's being used in the right way, 
and then also to ensure that messaging is consistent. All of the social media channels have a great you know, back end with analytics so we can see what kind of posts they're enjoying, what we should be posting more, um, how we can reach them differently. And this ensures that we are effective in our goal to promote the value and the importance of the county's programs, policies, and services. Hopefully you've had a chance to review the social media policy and you'll see that there is a section that addresses content that is not permitted on our pages. This information is actually outlined on the about section of each social media account that we have. So rules and regulations, what is not permitted on our pages, everyone who accesses them can see that information. Some of our goals, we have three goals, and that is to increase public awareness of the county's programs, policies, and services, um, and also promote the value and importance of those services. To distribute this vital information quickly and accurately, they're getting it from us, directly from the source. And then also to maintain open, professional, and responsive communication with members of the public and also the news media. Why do followers, likes, and impressions matter to a county? We want people to attend our events and educational programs. We want them to feel positive about the community in which they live so that they are supportive of our initiatives and projects. We also want to showcase the well-rounded community in which we live. And this could appeal to industries who might be interested in bringing business to our county. Getting our information in front of our residents and property owners is important. Social media accounts offer a unique opportunity to connect, whether that's to relay specific information or just to make a positive impression. And this is what the Dare County government Facebook and Instagram accounts would provide. I'll now open the floor up to questions. Thank you for your time. Dorothy and I are here for any questions you guys might have. Hey, I just have a curiosity. How much activity do we have Twitter-wise? Not a lot. I think we have um, currently around 4,000 followers on our Twitter account, which isn't bad, um, but it's just not the tool that our community is using. When you look at the people who are accessing the information, we've got a lot of news and media sources, some local people, but a lot of people from out of the area. Um, I think Facebook, we can target people a bit better in the right way, people in our community. So how quick are we to react to somebody that posts and doesn't meet that criteria? We actually can assign filters on the pages. So we have a profanity filter. So if there's any sort of profanity, it's automatically filtered out. And um, no one can actually post on the pages aside from Dorothy, Stephanie, and myself. That was going to be my question. Yeah. Who yeah. can actually put something right. on that page? Yeah. And as long as it's you three... Right. And exactly. I feel a lot better. I right. Now people from the public can comment on a post. So people can comment on some of our posts. We would have that open. But again, we could have um, certain words filtered out and profanity filters. And then, of course, we'd be monitoring it regularly. It'd be just, just like I'll use the voice as an example. They post an article and then you can make a comment. Mm -hmm. And ours would work in the same principle. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Is there any but, but those comments are within the criteria that are set for commenting. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. right. Uh, so we're coming into Facebook age late in the game, obviously. Lots of places have Facebook. Lots of counties have Facebook. And I'll have to say that the reason that we're so late coming in has mostly been concerns that I've had for a while about whether we should do this and how would we do it and all of those things. Um, yeah, how do we monitor it? When we started looking at it, there were two people in the office. Well, Dorothy and her team were stretched thin. We didn't really have the ability to monitor it. And so if we weren't going to monitor it. In my mind, it wasn't a good idea to have it because we couldn't control the kind of things that you were going to be concerned about because we wouldn't be monitoring it. Um, archiving it. You know, I was concerned because once you put it out there, it's a public record. We got to have the ability to archive it, and we were searching for ways to archive it properly. Um, comments: how, how do we control? This isn't designed to be the political forum, and so we we've got controls if we think in about the comments and what they're supposed to be and all that. 
uh, to try to control that. There are other places to do that. This isn't what we intend this to be. Um, and, you know, and then it's also not the place to question and answer. As we've seen with the Avon project, I spent a tremendous amount of time responding to emails and questions that we needed to respond to in that forum for that purpose. But there'd be no way that we could keep up and monitor all the Facebook traffic that might be out there and respond to all those questions. And so that was a concern to me. Caitlin came on board and resolved some of the monitoring issues because it increased Dorothy's staff. It's a great communication tool and they told you that the statistics of how people get information and we're missing that if we don't do it. Um, you know, we resolve most of my concerns. There's gonna be Facebook comments that we may or may not like, that's the nature of the beast and we just have to accept that if we're gonna use this medium to go out. And then most importantly, it's the communication tool and the analytics that she can do on that can tell us if we're getting our message out, where we're getting it to and if we're not, where we need to be getting it to. And so those are all important as we go forward. And so I think that the concerns that we have and the hiccups that are gonna occur are probably worth it in terms of the good that we can do and the information that we can get out and get out quickly. And so, uh, and then finally, consolidating all of our face, we had 10 people that were kind of randomly doing Facebook. We're bringing that under one umbrella now. It all has to be looked at by Dorothy and Caitlin and their team to be sure that we're sending the same message that it's one county, one operation, that we're doing things the right way and we don't have one place saying one thing and, and conflicting with something we're saying somewhere else. And so having that control makes it all right too. So when you put all that together, the work that they've done at least alleviates my concerns um, as much as they can be alleviated. <laughs> and, and I think that with that said, I gave them to the go ahead to bring this to you all as a way that we probably need to move in that direction. So, Good. Anyone else have any questions of Dorothy? Or Kate, yeah, I, or I've got one, one question. On, on Facebook uh, in particular, um, you can actually boost a post mm -hmm. by paying. It's a small fee, but still it's money that you have to pay. Mm -hmm. We will not be doing that, correct? We may um, with different events, and we yeah. would have that in our advertising budget. So okay. that we, we didn't meet that this year, so we would have <laughs> that money theoretically to apply um, next year. We would kind of allocate some of that money to some ads for mm -hmm. different events that we know we've struggled to get participation at in the past. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a great tool for that. So really how do uh, what, how do we use this tool for uh, visitors? I mean, we have traditionally had the same kind of markets and demographics coming here. Now we've got people who are coming here who couldn't name the villages that they just went through. They're first timers. So. <laughs> I mean, you can chime in, Dorothy, but we put out lots of information, but we only really put it out in two mediums. We put it out on our Facebook page and we put it out in current TV in different ways. And so what we're going to be doing is putting out essentially the same information that we've always put out, but we're going to broaden our reach because Facebook will reach so many more people than either of those mediums reach and so it's to put out the message of the county it's not an advertising forum for tourism or whatever um, it's to put out the things that we think the public needs to know about what we're doing from from events and festivals to large item pickup to emergency management you name it we we put all that out now but we reached only the segment that look at those two sources. By adding all of these other sources, we've broadened our reach tremendously, and we hope that we can get more people, more engagement, more understanding in the community of what we're doing uh, on all of those things. Commissioner Couch, to your point, I think the Visitors Bureau is, I mean, they have a long yeah. following, yeah. and they Six appeal figures. to the visitors. Um, I see our pages more for the people who live here and work here and own property here. But there is a, I mean, we're all seeing it. People that own property here are starting to think, wow, this is a great place to live. So I think there is an opportunity for some lifestyle type posting, let that kind of love where you live 
I mean, let's face it, we have an incredible lifestyle here. And I do think that's something that we can mix into it. But I, I see the Visitors Bureau as that visitor. Um, but certainly, if you think there's some ways that we can use it with the geography and to help people understand, I, I think the history is an incredible part of who we are. And I would see us making some posts that reference the history. But the other thing is, the things that we just use large item pickup. Someone out of town who doesn't follow our webpage religiously won't know that. But if they're on our Facebook page, they see that every day and the post will come up and they'll get it and they'll know. Um, we have links in our GIS that will tell you where the dog parks are. Well, if we've got something going out in that Facebook page, and they, they'll know to link to that GIS and they can find the dog park or the, the driver's license bureau or a number of other things that we have layered in our GIS that unless you're on our webpage, you won't get. But in our social media presence, when that stuff goes out, Dorothy said earlier that it links back to our webpage. It directs them where they can get that and it brings to their attention that they might need to look at that. Um, and so, you know, people stay on Facebook, as you know, all the time. They don't stay on their web, on our webpage all the time. And so we're going to reach a lot more with the things that, that we do and that we need to get to. And, and our communication will improve tremendously. Um, um, I, Commissioner Beck, I agree with what you guys are doing. And thank you for all your hard work bringing this thing together. I just want to throw out that, you know, this is a double-edged sword that we're getting into. Um, the time you put the post out there, you think everybody's going to possibly love. All of a sudden, you're going to have five people that come and completely blast you and then share it with 500 people of their nearest Facebook friends over something that you thought you were doing really, really good. And we've done it in the restaurant business with a special we did one time. And... It just came back. I, I told my girl that does all our Facebook stuff. I said, I don't want to hear the posts like that. I don't want negativity. I've got on this thing as a tool to expand my business, to get the word out. I want it to be used as that, not as a sounding board for someone who had a bad day because the sun didn't shine and it rained. And so we need to be really careful about monitoring those things because it will come back on that other side of the sword with you. Your concern was my concern. <laughs> they told me I was old and I needed to get with the times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I listen, I'm, I'm, old. I I'm old too, but I, I, live, I live in the jungle um, and, and I deal with it every day. But what they really said was that, that that debate goes on on Facebook, whether we're on Facebook or not. And if That's we're true. going to use the, we're not going to stop that debate. It's happening right now as we speak, it will continue to happen. Um, and we're not going to stop that from happening. And us not being on Facebook doesn't resolve any of that, but it eliminates that communication tool. So basically, we're going to create the, the communication tool. And yeah, we'll we'll get negative stuff on there. We can't help it. That's what Facebook seems to be. But we'll also get our message out. Yeah. I have one comment, uh, Dorothy. I think that we should get the county manager a TikTok account. <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will resist. <laughs> All right. Anyone else have any questions? Dorothy, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to approve the uh, social media use guidelines and policies. May yeah. I request that you all accept it with a few minor revisions that were made? There with is, a few minor revisions. It's nothing of substance. And we need to correct the You 10, correct the one. And I then there was mention. a reference to images. And then we had to add Flickr to our list on the last page. So they're very minor edits. But I is the maker of the motion, motion willing to accept that? I am willing to accept that. OK, so the maker of the motion, Mr. Mr. House, has suggested, uh, has made a motion to approve and update the policy, uh, social media use guidelines and policy presented this evening uh, by a public information officer on March the 15th, 2021 with some, with some uh, uh, revisions. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by Commissioner Bateman. The floor is open for discussion for further comments. Hearing none, those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 aye.
Opposed, like sign. The motion carries unanimously. Good job, Thank Hester. You. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Well done. Well done. Well done. Chairman, that brings us to <clears throat> item eight on the agenda. Um, gosh, I don't know how long ago it was. A lot of meetings <laughs> ago. Um, we hired, I think at that time it was Aptum, um, and Aptum to come in and do a dredge and material placement project study for us. Um, they, Aptum is Ken and his group have now become Coastal Protection and Engineering of North Carolina. Uh, but they are here to, Ken's here tonight to present uh, what they found and to talk to you about that and, and ask whatever questions you have about uh, material placement going forward. All right. Ken, how the heck are you? Doing well. Happy to be up here. Yeah, yeah I was I was back there sitting trying to figure out when it was, but no, no. I'm sure it was it was pre pandemic. So yes, it was. The whole yeah. world has changed oh, yeah. since. Yeah, last just time trying to I find saw. us on Twitter. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> find us on Twitter. Follow us. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it's been a it's been a fun study to put this uh, this document together. Um, just a ton of information. Uh, it'll take you guys a long time to read through this thing. And, and I think we, we set it out. We'll talk a little bit about how it's structured as more of a reference document. But I mean, at the end of the day, we had some very specific purposes and goals of this thing. And I think we've satisfied those. And so tonight I want to, uh, I know um, Commissioner Tobin and Commissioner Couch have both been following this as it's going on from the Oregon Inlet Task Force and the Deer County Waterways Commission. Um, Brent's been really involved in the study, but uh, for you all, and uh, also for anybody that's watching, just to kind of give you like the Cliff Notes version of how this thing's laid out, and then you guys can dive into your specific areas and, and figure this thing out. But I do want to spend a few minutes uh, tonight kind of going over these recommendations. Uh, it was a lot of information to kind of for us to digest and for us to organize. And so we've laid out these, these eight different recommendations in, in, in a fair amount of detail in the general report. And I want to kind of overview those for you tonight and uh, just get, give you all an opportunity to, to ask, uh, ask any questions about those. Um, so <clears throat> real quick, we'll go over the, uh, the review of the goals of the project. I'll talk a little bit about how this thing is laid out. The report, as I said, it's, it's pretty large report. It's about 85 pages long, but I'll just give you a, a brief overview of how it's laid out, which will help you help you dive into it. And then we'll spend a few minutes on these recommendations. So the goals of the project way back a year plus ago when, when the world was a different place, uh, we set out to, to provide additional capacity for maintenance of federal and non-federal navigation channels throughout the county. So the Corps had approached the county on no, numerous occasions, said there were issues, there were specific channels where they were running out of capacity. So we wanted to find some additional capacity. But we didn't just want to uh, you know go in and, and do things the way they had always been done. We wanted to put a stress on uh, trying to find alternatives that would enhance coastal resilience, figure out ways of beneficially using this, this uh, material. So that was a big focus of the study. Um, the first part of the study was basically finding all the information that was out there. A lot of this information comes from the Corps of Engineers. So conducting this needs assessment, um, figuring out where the channels are, how much volume comes out of it, how frequently they're dredged, what's the type of material in those channels, and that was kind of step one. And then the, the next step of, of the process, the goal of the process was to provide you all with some short-term recommendations and some big picture long-term recommendations of how you might move forward um, with some of these alternatives in, in the long run. And then ultimately, uh, part of the contract that, that was awarded to our firm was to move forward a certain number of these short-term alternatives and actually get some permits in place so that for the short term, you all had some, some additional capacity. All right, and so the report layout, the, after you get through the short introduction section, uh, basically we de detail this needs assessment. We talk about how we, how we found the data, how we acquired it, how we looked at it. There's some really great tables in there that kind of walk you through um, dredge frequency, the volume that comes out of that, what would 20 years of capacity for a particular channel look like, the type of material that's in there. Uh, so that kind of takes you through the needs assessment. Um, and then when you get into this concept alternative, I think that's that's section three of the report. There are 22 different concepts that were laid out in this report. And that's one of the reasons why it's so long to get through those concepts, um, spanning from building new bird islands to new confined disposal facilities to thin layer placement options, 
um, to using the, the 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 new private public partnership dredge that's getting that's that's being built that'll come online and how that can be used to defer some of the maintenance on on these uh, these different channels. Uh, and then the final section, or I'm, I'm sorry, the, the fourth section is this alternative screening. So we've got, you know, imagine we've got 22 different alternatives and how do we wrap our head around weighing these different 22 alternatives? It doesn't all come down to cost or the ability to permit. So we can created sort of this creative matrix that you can comparatively look at different options and kind of rack and stack those options based on whether or not you're worried about cost or permitting or whether you need to acquire easements or how many cost sharing partners you might be able to bring into specific alternatives. And that's all laid out in that, that alternative um, for alternative screening section. And then the final section gets into uh, the recommendations. So the recommendations, essentially we developed uh, a number of short-term and long-term strategies we obviously utilized all the information, the needs assessment information, the screening matrix, a lot of uh, feedback from different stakeholders. As I mentioned, we've briefed the Waterways Commission a number of times. We've briefed, briefed the Oregon Inlet Task Force a number of times. Uh, Brent's my best friend back there. We talk two or three times a week on different different ideas. So lots of input from the county. Um, there's a section in the needs in the needs assessment that talks about different stakeholder groups. Uh, that we've reached out to to get information to develop these recommendations. And so we came up with eight different recommendations and I remember these slides correctly. Yeah. So we'll go through a couple of different slides that kind of outline each of these recommendations. So the very first recommendation is essentially to for for the the the, the county commission to move forward and pursue the permitting of these short-term alternatives, okay? So geographically it gets into kind of how how we paid for the project. Geographically, there's a central Dare County region, which essentially is everything that connects to Oregon Inlet plus Stumpy Point. And then we've got a southern Dare County section, which is essentially everything south of Oregon Inlet, uh, Rodanthe and, and all of the channels down around Hatteras, uh, Hatteras Village. And so recommendation number one, and, th and that's actually what we're what one, one of the things we'd like to come out of this presentation is an approval to move forward on recommendation number one would be to um, get permits in place for um, the modification of Island H, which is the big confined disposal facility right outside of, uh, of Wanchies. Uh, we've got a couple of ideas about how to modify that, potentially raising the dikes, potentially opening it up and, and pushing some of that material out. We've got really good numbers from the Corps of Engineers um, on what they need to achieve capacity for one more dredging <laughs> event. And that's really what we've targeted for this Island H. We realize it's not a long-term commitment. It is filled to its capacity, but there's a few tweaks that could be made to it to potentially use it one more time that gets us past the short term. And then we think about the long term. Um, establish some additional bird islands over there um, near Old House Channel. That gives some additional capacity that, that may not be the very top of the priority of what the Corps of Engineers needs right now, but there's a lot of data that's been developed, uh, environmental data, um, actually uh, setting, physical setting data for that area. And we feel like we can we can leverage that information that's already available that the Corps has done a lot of these investigations and actually move forward and, and get some permits in place for that. Ken, yes, sir. well, um, on the on the Island H, Yes, you said it's it's reaching its its capacity. You might be able to do one more. What what are the limiting factors on that? Is it is it just uh, surface area height uh, combination of the two? What what is it? Correct. So obviously it's it's kind of a bowl on the inside, and and and, and there is an area that can be calculated within that bowl, and and when the when the core is pumping into that bowl, if you will, um, with one of these larger pipeline dredges. You, most of the material that's being pumped in there is water. And then there's a certain amount that's sand that falls out. Well, through their experience, the way that they handle this is essentially they want about two times the volume of sand or material, sediment that they want to pump in there. If they want to pump 100,000 cubic yards in there, they want enough area to be able to pump 200,000 yards of slurry in there. And they know that, you know, the dewatering process through that, that they can kind of manage it there. And it, it's not constant shutdowns from the dredge. And then they also have a two foot freeboard around the entire thing that, that in the middle of a storm, 
or in the, in the middle of a dredging event where this thing's all the way filled up, if there was some sort of a huge rain event that added, you know, 18 inches of water on top of it, that it's still not overtopping and you're, you're not worried about, um, you know, scour as, as things start to leak out of there. So that's, that's how they've determined what the capacity is. There, there are so, so little capacity that they know that using that formula, they can only place, you know, 40,000, 50,000 cubic yards in that, in that hole. How is the bowl generated? Uh, it was it was originally generated by constructing dikes around around that area, um, so it would have been you know probably flat marsh back in the very beginning when that thing right. was constructed. And so, they, so what is what is what reason can you not continue to do that? There are there are some considerations from Wildlife Resources Commission where they have some some limits. Um, there's also you know engineering limits as to how high you want to make these dikes before they become unstable. Um, you, you'd obviously want to, you would want to keep the top of those um, dikes at a certain uh, width so that you can get, you know, earth moving equipment around it. So in order to maintain that and have the right slope coming down on the, on the inside, unless you start expanding it outward, essentially the higher you go, the smaller you're making the, the inside opening. Right. Um, so the, there's those factors that, that the Corps of Engineers has wrestled with over time. Thank you. Sure. Um, one of the other short-term alternatives is, is uh, looking at something down at Stumpy Point. Um, we've got this experience now with, the, with the, the, the Manio project that's finishing up out there, this bucket and barge uh, project that's, that's been fairly successful handling this, this finer grain material. Um, the Corps... The core dredges the outer portion of Stumpy Point, but once you get into where it meets the ferry terminal, the core doesn't do any dredging further into that and into the boat basin. Uh, and so there, there, there is an interest in, in trying to maintain that a little deeper than what it is right now. And we've talked about, about a couple of alternatives um, and a permitting process that we may be able to move that forward. Um, there's, some, there's, there's a small plot that's owned by Dare County down there. There's another plot that's privately owned that, uh, that, that property owners expressed some interest in working with us to come up with, with a plan there. So that's one that we would say pursue in the short term. Um, open water disposal. Ken, Ken, let me, uh, let's go back if you don't mind. What's the 3.15, the 3. Point, what, what is, what does that represent? 3.15 yeah, so, what? Yeah. In the document, Thanks for asking that. Sure. So it's in the, in the document, I, I been really in the document. In section three, which is where all of these different alternatives are laid out, if you wanted to find the Stumpy Point Harbor description, you would go to section three, alternative you. number fifteen. So okay. it's it's alternative three point one five. Yeah, I'm reading three point one two right now to get more detail. It's comprehensive, on this man. Good luck. <laughs> Very good. Um, open water. To open water disposal in areas of previously authorized uh, dredging. So specifically. There are a couple of areas that the Corps of Engineers has authorization to, to, to bottom dump, to, 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 to place sediment. In these deep channels, as you come up from Hell's Gate towards the bridge, uh, there are sections that are naturally you know, 20 feet, 22 feet in that section. And recently, the Corps, the Corps has been authorized to do it for a long time. Recently, the Corps has had some discussions with the agencies about actually doing it, and the Corps has been doing it on a limited basis. So basically developing a concept where if certain thresholds are met that, you know, either the cores dredge or when the private public partnership dredge comes online, uh, you see that that reference to the PPP dredge, that's, that's how we refer to it in the, in the report. Once that dredge comes online that you would have permits to be able to potentially take material from, you know, the entrance channel at Wanchi's and drop and drive it down there and potentially place it in those scour holes or any other hot spot that you might have between Manio all the way down to, to the bridge, potentially being able to place it in those those areas. So that's that's three point one two. Uh, dredging of channels with the private public partnership um, dredge. Um, basically, every channel that uh, I'd say every channel that we cover in the in the report we're looking to have permits in place so that when that dredge comes online, that dredge can remove material from those channels and there would be specific designated areas, whether they're areas where there are already permits in place to dump or part of the short-term process, we're getting new new locations to, to place that material, that that, that private-public partnership dredge could come in there and remove material. 
Uh, and then the last one that, that's in the central Dare County project area is the restoration of Green Island. Green Island is kind of a, it's a, it's a bird island. It's a low elevation island just inside of, um, of the new bridge. It, it's sort of a little bit further to the south, closer to the Pea Island side. Uh, if you went out there today on a boat, you probably wouldn't see anything exposed out of the water there. Um, but it's something, it's something that where if we had permits in place, you could, you could pump material to this island and restore it, build up the elevation over time, the way that some of these other islands are, are managed by the Corps of Engineers and Wildlife Resources Commission. And the reason we threw this in there is that in going through the stakeholder exercise, there's a lot of interest on the part of National Park Service, Wildlife Resources Commission, um, the Nature Conservancy, Coastal Federation, a lot of groups want to see the restoration of Green Island. And so we think it's a low threshold to move the, for, through the permitting process. And uh, although it, it's hard to identify specifically how that island might be used in the short term, having that permit in place and, and uh, you know, having another tool in the toolbox, we, we just believe that, you know, that, that it could only benefit the county of having that option in the future. Uh, and then moving down in the in the southern part of the, the project area, um, down around Hatteras Island, there are two primary alternatives that we're looking at down there. One would be to try to permit additional open water disposal for the, the special purpose dredge uh, or the, the private-public partnership dredge. Um, this would be different than, than 3.12 that, that uh, Chairman or, or uh, Commissioner Ross just mentioned. This would be areas that are not currently authorized but that we've looked at through this study. And we think that we should pursue these because that really opens up the potential of in the short term, dredging out Rollinson Channel and placing that material somewhere to, to get a little bit more depth through Rollinson Channel. Um, we looked a lot of different alternatives down there as far as you know what, what to do with this fine grain material in Rollinson Channel. And uh, none of the alternatives that when we, we identify a lot of alternatives, but none of them are something that we would characterize as short term alternatives. These are things that are going to take a lot of environmental review, a lot of documentation to get them pushed through and permitted. And so we've put this other option of identifying some areas that are that are essentially further out in the sound as potential dispersal disposal options and trying to get permits to, to do that. And then the last one for the Southern Southern Dare County is the same as what we mentioned in the, the central part, uh, essentially getting permits in place for all of the channels to be able to use that new dredge when it comes online uh, and have have disposal options that, that can be managed by or that can be used by that new dredge when it comes online. Ken, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with Craney Island? Yes. Up, uh, up near Norfolk? Yeah. No, it's in it's in. Uh... It's uh, um, it's in Portsmouth. It's it's okay. area. Um, is that wishful thinking that we we can potentially do something like that instead of all of these sites? Yeah, I mean it's two yeah. miles out, two miles across, <laughs> two miles in, and they've been doing that for thirty years. Yeah, so, I'm. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges with something like that is the economics. So some of the alternatives that we looked at do look at building something like Island H, you know, out, you know, whether, whether it's connected to the mainland or whether it's, you know, out in the water and the amount of material, you know, you've got to have the right material to be able to build those dikes up. And, you know, even if they're low dikes to start containing it and, you know, they're, they're, with the sediment data that we have right now, there's uncertainty as to whether or not that material is here you know, locally, or will we have to truck it in, which really drives the cost up. Uh, we've talked to some folks about using geotextile tubes, and maybe even if the material is not compatible, you pump it in this tube, and the tube gives it some rigidity that maybe you can start building the foundation of those with something like that. So up there, where you're talking about where they're maintaining, you know, the, the port of Norfolk and, you know, the, the channel coming into the Chesapeake Bay, right. I mean, the economics are so huge up there that, they can justify all sorts of construction costs like that. Um, you know, real estate's a, an issue down here as well. I mean, we've talked to the, the National Park Service about potentially using some of their areas. We've talked to, um, we've identified some, you know, privately owned areas that you could potentially do something like that. So it's a combination of the economics and the uh, and the real estate that, that makes that kind of challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Ken, you talked about doing some of these and 
making bird islands and that kind of thing. <coughs> so we spend the money to get permits. We do all the work to get a bird island. The birds come and then they say, now you can't use the <laughs> island because you got the birds on it. How do right. we avoid that loop? <laughs> Yeah, I think through the process, you know, we we would need to um, we would need to establish what the purpose and needs of these projects are, and it's a balancing act because um, you know some some of these agencies will you know they'll 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 try to claim that the purpose and need is that it's a bird island because it's a it's it's less um, you know it's less adversarial to move that through the process, but when when the final product comes out of the of the permit you've got all sorts of conditions there that the purpose and needs was to provide habitat for, for these birds. And so you've got a lot of conditions that need to satisfy that. Whereas if we're clear that the purpose and need is for dredge disposal, yet we will abide by certain reasonable conditions in terms of, you know, the, the maximum height, or, you know, maybe there's some management needs out there from once in a while, if you've got to, you know, clear the the vegetation or something like that. So it's it's about establishing, you know, some clear purpose and needs up front and making sure that what you're building is, a, a, you know, a place that you need to put material that you're going to try to make as nice for birds as possible, as opposed to first and foremost, it's a, it's a bird habitat. All right. Um, this is just kind of a summary in terms of that recommendation number one. So one of the things I want to stress is part of the contract that we were awarded was to move forward with this. So the the, the scope of work um, and you know the scope of work involved in advancing these alternatives that I just spent a, a, you know a few minutes talking about, those are included in the existing contract. There is no additional appropriation of funds on the part of the county to move that forward. Um, once notice of, notice to proceed is issued, we hold an interagency meeting. We've got a lot more information now than we had the first time we talked to the agencies about the details of these specifics. Um, we anticipate about, about, uh, anticipate about 14 to 18 months to be able to move forward with this particular alternative, which includes, you know, numerous permits for numerous different, different, uh, uh facilities. Uh, and then, you know, there's a number of environmental documents that need to be written. And then some of the alternatives would require, additional sediment sampling. And that kind of throws us into this alternative number or recommendation number two. Uh, recommendation number two, essentially, we were able to get all of this, this, this core of engineers, VibraCore data, sediment data um, that they have um, from, from these past channels. And they've got a lot of good data um, down in the southern part of, of uh, the county. In fact, they just awarded a contract to a VibraCore contractor that's going to be taking some samples up in Barney Slough and Sloop Channel. They, they may actually be on site now or this week. Um, but in the northern part of, the, of the, 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 the project area, closer to Oregon Inlet, especially the ranges that go up through the main trunk line from, from, the, from Oregon Inlet, Old House Channel, all the way up to, to Manio, that data either doesn't exist anymore or like the documentation on that data is it, it's so general that we wouldn't be able to pursue permits to do some of these other things with the, with um, you know, with, with that type of material. Cause we just don't know what percent finds the material is. And we did, you know, we don't know the color of the material. We don't know, um, you know, the mineralogy of the material. So, you know, it's been asked to me a number of times uh, in some of the, the waterway commission meetings. Well, you know, the core has been doing it forever. The core has been doing it forever. Why would we need to take new, new cores? The, the, the situation is that we're trying to get new permits for something. And in order for us to justify these, these new permits that, you know, that, that the material is compatible to use with whatever we're saying we want to use it for, we're going to have to prove to them that that material is compatible. And in the Northern part of the, the County, the data that the core has available is not sufficient to, to make that case. And so <clears throat> under recommendation two, there's a couple of different tables that kind of lay out the areas that we think are prior, prior, priority locations where some additional cores should be taken. We've recommended taking a couple of cores up on Island H uh, to understand the type of material that's there so that if we are gonna make some of these modifications, um, that, that, that we can justify those modifications, both from an environmental and from an engineering standpoint. Um, we've got some contingencies in there that if we get into Stumpy Point or, or um, you know, Wan Cheese or something like that, where the agencies are asking for um, contaminant testing that we're able to take, we're, we, we've got that sediment and we can run those through those tests as well. So 
essentially, recommendation number two is a move forward with conducting the sediment sampling. I'd say that recommendation number one, I said that, you know, there isn't an, an additional allocation of funds to move to start moving forward with that. But in, in our opinion, these VibraCore data are going to be necessary to move that process all the way forward. Likelihood is going to be that they're going to ask for them. Correct. Regardless. Correct. Yeah. So. What's the approximate cost of all this fiber core data? Um, the ones that we've delineated as priority fiber cores, I think it's around a hundred thousand. Um, Brent, does that sound, does that sound right? I know we've kind of sliced and diced them in a couple different ways, but. 130 plus. 30 plus 30. 130 plus. No, just Okay. Okay. And that, but that includes the, um, that, that includes the five for the Hatteras yeah. Ocean Bar? Okay. All right. All right. Ken, while we're on the subject of, of doing core samples and this sort of thing, um, to determine what the dirt's suitable for, um, and, and reading through this, I know you, you showed the Fort Raleigh area of, of Lost Colony. And when you have an escarpment that, that's like that is now, why does it matter? Because it's going to be in the parking lot before we can turn around real good. There'll be no parking lot. Uh, why, why does, I understand that it matters, but in a, in a situation like that, when any kind of dirt seems like would help, uh, is, is there just no wiggle room in that sort of thing? Or yeah. What? I mean, you know, up there, it, it gets even more complicated because Park Service is probably going to have their. I mean, if they if they make a des, if they make a determination that they're they're the only thing that they're concerned about is protecting the infrastructure that's up there, and they want to stop that erosional scarp, um, you know, then they they may be willing to you know place different material out there. But but anytime you're placing below the water line, you know, the agencies have the ability to say no. This is you know this is going to create too much. Um, you know, too much turbidity in the water or that, you know, this is too unlike, um, you know, the, the native sediments that are there and you're going to harm whatever is below the water. So as long as, I mean, if you're really talking about kind of putting in almost like a beach bill where it's not just, you're, you're not just piling up a, a bunch of sand right there at the escarpment, if you could keep it above the water line, um, you know, maybe, maybe you have a few more options on the type of material that you're going to use. But I think what they're proposing is, um, you know, making it more, you know, more of a natural beach type environment there or natural shoreline that you would see uh, in that area prior to that erosional scarp. And so I, I believe both the agencies and particular for, for that alternative, the Park Service is also going to be real interested in, you know, what is this material? I mean, if it's the same material that's coming out of the, 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 the you know, that, that, uh, the, the shallow bag bay project right now, that's got a, just a lot of clay in it. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's probably it, 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 even from an engineering standpoint, it's not, it's not going to help very much. Uh, it's just going to slough off back in. So. Thank you. Sure. Um, so recommendation number three, um, deals with, uh, deals with a, a bunch of the alternatives. One of, we were just talking about this Fort Raleigh shoreline up there. So in going through, so, some of the alternatives, alternative 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and 3.5, they're all essentially up in that northern Roanoke Island area. Uh, and some of the alternatives deal with trying to build, you know, new bird islands in a linear fashion out in front of that to act as a wave break. And some of the projects, I mean, in theory, they're, they're, they're good concepts. Um, they can be done. But in order to permit those types of alternatives, I think that both from an environmental standpoint and an engineering standpoint, numerical modeling would really help make those decisions. And so to come up here and just say, you know, hey, we recommended more work and we're great at doing it, you know, give us a contract. Like that wasn't the intention of recommendation number three. If you read the whole thing, it talks about if you were to set one of these models up, there are a number of other communities in the area, Manio, Nags Head, you know, potentially even over the, the community over at uh, Mans Harbor, um, other places in Dare County, the Park Service could benefit not only on these alternatives, but in uh, in other ways in the future, having this model to be able to look at different alternatives of how to manage, um, you know, sea level rise and things like that, climate change. And so we also looked at, you know, who are other collaborative partners. We talked to um, Reed Corbett at CSI. 
Um, he's real interested. He's got a number of, you know, pretty cool toys and, and some good students that can run, collect data and things like that. So it's more of a, if, if any of these alternatives interest you, you may want to move in this direction. And there are some partnerships that you could form to help you advance these particular alternatives. Ken, is, um, go back. When you refer to the spit adjacent to Andy Griffin, is that better known as Banana Island? I've heard that a couple of times. I think, what's it? Was it, it Harry is. that brought it up? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can we can call it that in the final report. No, but I mean, is, it, is <laughs> that, that that area? Yeah. Jim? Yes. Because yeah. yeah. that's, yes. I mean, that's hugely popular. Well, I mean, hugely popular. Bob, in this list too, where it says open water disposal north of Roanoke Island, right? There's actually a whole a very large pile of tires you know, from years north ago. of the channel that it were put out there years and years and right. years and years ago. And one of the ideas that we've kicked around is actually capping those tires right. with sediment uh, okay, um, and making more of a reef out there instead of just having a bunch of old rubber tires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Absolutely. All right. Um, recommendation number four, part of the needs assessment, we developed sort of an internal GIS and then we put it online and Brent was able to use it and some of the other folks in the county were able to use it um, to look at, you know, where all this data is, what are some of the environmental data we use to figure out, you know, to prioritize the areas that we wanted to look at. And it ended up through the study becoming a pretty useful tool. All of the channels are in there. You can click on the channels. You can see all of those tables that I talked about earlier where it has the frequency of dredging, the type of material, that's all in that, that, that GIS. And so we put this recommendation in here that either, you know, a, an outside firm or using uh, county, county resources to try to create this as more of a long-term tool to use for, for management purposes. Um, one would be, you know, basically to be able to track in real time when the Corps of Engineers does a new survey and throws it on their site, this site would pull that down and then the manager would be able to click on a specific channel and know how much material is in that channel, not have to ask somebody, you know, an engineer or a CAD person or something to go ahead and compute it. They would know how much material is in that channel up to the authorized depth. The other thing is you can, you know, we've, we've developed some statistics based on the data that we were able to get from the Corps of Engineers, but 10 years from now, if you take all of the projects that are done by the core or the core subs out to pipeline contractors or that you all are doing and all that gets fed into this database, then your statistics become even better to be able to predict in the future. And so uh, it's something that, that, that Brent and I talked about that we talked about internally with our team. And actually just last week, we had a really good call call with uh, the county's GIS department. And I think it seems like they have the capabilities in house to be able to, to be able to do this. So, we're kind of looking at a, a transition period over the next couple of months, um, get some more direction. But I think the county will be able to manage that. And, and that should be a real powerful tool for folks like Brent that are managing this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Your modeling goes in there too. Can, it can be ju just another aspect of it that is just storing resource. all that information. Yep. yep. Um, all right. Recommendation number five. Um, we, uh, there were a number of different alternatives that deal with confined disposal facilities. So this is similar to Island H. So we identified essentially three of them. One would be uh, some private land that's over there north of Juan Cheese off of Tillett Road. One would be sort of across the waterway on National Park Service land. And then one is, uh, is, is further down in the southern part of the county near where um, the, the breach occurred during Hurricane Isabel. And so we, we, we've got a lot of information about how much volume and you know, some estimates on cost and things like that in the report that, that deal with that. But those are some of those alternatives that are going to take a lot, of, a lot of effort to try to advance. Those are seen as more long-term solutions. And so this recommendation in particular says that if you all, you know, once you're able to digest this report, um, if you all believe that you want to pursue some of these long-term alternatives with having a confined disposal facility um, at, at, at your fingertips, um, that there are, there are some things that you can do sort of incrementally to move that process forward. So there's some site development that would need to be done to look at, you know, are there, are there wetlands on these sites? Where are the wetlands? Where could something like this be actually sited on a particular property? Are there SAVs that will be impacted over there? 
Um, do we have the data, the, the, the survey data that we need to actually come up with a design so that we can accurately estimate the cost of something like this and present it to the agencies? Um, you know, geotechnical, is, is there sediment on site that can be used to construct these things or will we have to truck it in? That all goes to being able to accurately estimate the cost. So recommendation five basically talks about if, you, if we're going to move forward with these CDFs, some of these alternatives, that these are some, some next steps that need to be taken. Uh, that's not going to break the bank, but you know those, those types of investigations would need to be taken as a next step to figure out um, how viable those are in the long term. Um, alternative six and alternative seven essentially make some recommendations as to um, funding some of these projects over the long haul. Um, number six deals with the Corps of Engineers continued, uh, uh, continued authority program. Um, so the, 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 the marsh restoration project that's inside of the breakwaters right there at, at Wanchies, at the entrance to Wanchies, that's one of these Section 204 projects. It's essentially done by the Corps. Uh, the Corps has this continued authority to be able to do these projects, but it's a federal project. It takes a long time to get through. There's limited money in the beginning, so it's somewhat competitive. But there are, there are a number of good reasons why some of the alternatives in here would align with other sort of overarching goals of the Corps of Engineers, from thin layer placement to um, you know habitat rec uh, habitat recreation, and and generally this this CAP 206 or CAP 204, I'm sorry, is used for advancing beneficial use projects. So um, there are a number of different alternatives that we listed there. And, and in that actual section, we, you know, we, we describe in detail why we think that some of these CAP 204 projects might, uh, might work. Um, we actually contacted one of the guys that works up at the Norfolk district during the study, and they've actually just moved through a couple of thin layer placement projects up there where they were able to have the Corps of Engineers, the Corps of Engineers move through all of the environmental documentation process. And it took two or three years to get through it, but it was 100% federally funded to at least get all of the information you would need to have to be able to permit something like thin layer placement. Um, now, now they're looking for, you know, now they've, they've done this study and now they need a cost sharing partner that's going to share with the Corps' maintenance operation and actually do some of this thin layer placement and, and they're still shopping that around. But if you came to the table saying, hey, if we can get this thing permitted, federal government's gonna pay for the permitting of it and you know, tell us what the Delta cost is when, when it's time to do this thin layer placement and we'll see if we can afford it, then you know, that looks like something that, that's positive for a number of, on a number of fronts in the future. Is the thin layer study that they did up there transferable uh, I, I mean, it's going to be transferable for the federal agencies. The, the state agencies aren't going to see it as as tra as you know transferable. Um, I mean, certainly the science is transferable, but in terms of you know satisfying all the requirements of of the Division of Coastal Management, some of the state agencies would would be different. Um, similar to six, seven is essentially coordinating with state and Corps of Engineers on um, other types of beneficial use pilot projects. Uh, sort of sounds like the same thing that I just talked about, but uh, it, essentially word of 26, the Water Resource Development Act that the Corps passes every couple of years that authorizes all sorts of you know, federal projects. Um, there was a special stipulation put in the 2016 authorization that said um, Congress is interested in advancing at least 10 projects where we're beneficially using dredge sediment for something that the Corps isn't already doing. Um, in 2018, Congress liked that rule so much that they increased it from 10 to 20. And then the new word that was just passed a few months ago increased that number from 20 to 35. So Congress has said, we want 35 of these projects authorized, but Congress hasn't appropriated funds to build these 35 projects. They just say, this is a great idea. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, without, you know, without wasting a bunch of time and saying this is kind of pie in the sky, the reason that we include this in there is that there are some re recent studies done by the Corps of Engineers through what they're doing in the South Atlantic Division, which is essentially everything in the Caribbean and from, um, from Florida all the way up to um, uh, North Carolina, Virginia border. Actually, I think it, it goes around uh, into the Gulf to some extent as well. So that district of the core that's managing that area, um, they're doing this, this comprehensive regional study right now. And, they're, and, and, and one of the things that they found is that 
particularly when they look at navigation projects in the Wilmington district, there's a lot of fine grain material that needs to be dredged out of these channels that the Corps maintains with the Wilmington district. And that there aren't enough options to be able to deal with these types of sediment. And so they specifically call out things like thin layer placement, things like open water dispersal, where, you know, maybe you've got a big sound and you can, you can, determine a specific area where that material can be taken out there and placed and dumped. Um, you know, it helps if you've got a big, you know, deep hole, but they've done some of these, uh, some of these projects recently, the core is, has moved forward on some thin layer placement and some, uh, open water dispersal as they called it. And it's sort of like, we put it in there cause it's sort of ripe on things that the core is being told they need to focus more on. And so you've got this beneficial use pilot project out there, which, you know, is somewhat of an unfunded uh, endeavor, but you've got a lot of strong cases to be made with the types of projects you're trying to push, uh, as well as some, you know, some partnerships to develop to try to, to, try to advance that particular alternative. So uh, it, it's laid out in pretty good detail in, in the report and be happy to take any questions on that. The final recommendation <laughs> Uh, essentially has to deal specifically with Rodanthe Harbor. Um, the, the CDF down there, it's basically ready to, uh, to, to, um, to, to take material uh, if you were to do a dredge project down there. Um, but we recommended sort of a long-term uh, management plan that would look at, um, one, having some agreements in place that when that material is pumped in and it's now filled the capacity, that you have an established way of mining that material out and getting it out to, to whomever is using it and potentially get some money out of that process as well. Um, and then the other thing is potentially adding some recreational benefit down there. There are a couple of different grants through the Division of Coastal Management where you could, <clears throat> you could provide some additional water, waterfront access or, or recreational access down there. But what it may do is you know, potentially building a pier over top of the outfall pipe that's down there that gets all busted up in some of these storms, potentially something like that with, with leveraging the grant funding and being able to provide, you know, a, a additional improvement on the infrastructure that goes into that facility. Those are the types of things that we laid out there in, in recommendation number eight. So um, talked a long time, but I, I did want to spend some good time on those recommendations, make sure you all understand them, make sure that um, you know, they're clear and, and then, you know, answer any questions that you all have. Okay. Ken, thank you so much. Any questions of uh, Ken uh, concerning his presentation? Just one. Go ahead, Commissioner Ross. If we had a magic wand, because what it sounds like we're doing is planning for the next 20 years of taking sand that's going to wash in from the Atlantic Ocean, fill up Oregon Inlet, we're going to get boats to dig the sand that washed in and we're going to have to go find some place to dump it. Have I basically summarized the problem? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Oregon, believe it or not, Oregon Inlet isn't a huge focus in this because Oregon Inlet, I mean, there, there isn't a, there isn't a need for where to place the material that's dredged out of Oregon Inlet. It's mostly these interior channels where we're dealing with, you know, much finer grain sediment. That so within the sound, they're Correct. shifting from storms and or tides. It just shifts the bottom of the sand around in the sound. Correct. Rob, one thing you need to realize that the, all the major rivers in North Carolina feed our sound. Yes. And all that silt that's yes. washed out yes. the entire Comes length. in. So our sounds are basically kind of a, almost, for lack of a better term, a big delta right. of silt from that. So when you start looking at the sediments, it's not the ocean sediments. That's it's what it's, I was getting confused on, Jim. Thank very, you. This very is different. Very like Ken said, the sediments coming out of Shallow Bag Bay, there's a ton of clay underneath the sands. Yeah. There's and, a ton of movement, period. Yeah. In the sound. It's not a docile body of water so that, that people think. Yeah. That sediment that they dredge is not compatible. You couldn't take it and put it on P Island. They wouldn't allow it. See, this is actually very helpful to an uninitiated observer like myself. Just the global explanation that you and Danny provided in the last minute and a half was very helpful because I kept picturing all this sand coming in from the Atlantic as opposed to yeah. the delta from all the rivers emptying the sound and the need to maintain navigable channels within the sound. And it's a where challenge. Then, <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a challenge, right? Correct. Okay. That, that's actually very helpful. Thank you, guys. You can, in that regard, 
uh, the, the sediment that Jim's talking about that's coming uh, from the rivers for forever. Did that sediment, uh, all or any part of it, go out of the go out of Oregon Inlet on an outgoing tide? Uh, I, I mean, what it, whatever is you know whatever is suspended and it you know is still in in the water column when it's flowing out. I'm sure there's a you know I mean you can probably look at aerial photos and see the discoloration of the water on a, on an outgoing tide. Some of that material is going out, but some of the you know some of the sand from the ocean side is coming in as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the point being that if it were not, you would think over the thousands of years that this has been going on that the, that the sounds would be full of silt, that I, they did just fill up, which kind of come in full circle on this, and Jim's over there nodding, he knows exactly <laughs> where I'm going with this, <laughs> is if we don't get Oregon Inlet open enough to be an outlet as much as it is an inlet, then what we were just talking about is, I mean, it's acting like almost like a, a constriction at this point yeah. mm -hmm. that's going to allow more and more of this, uh, this type of sediment to build up in the sounds, which are going to have ecologically, I would think, a, a very detrimental effect on, on that being the nursery that we all know that it is at this point in time. Yeah, there, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's, you know, I'm sure people have quantified the input, but essentially one of the things in, in eastern North Carolina that we're dealing with is that we have a pretty wide coastal plain. And so by the time that the that the rivers get, you know, close to where they're feeding into these sounds, there isn't a whole lot of change in elevation like there would be up, you know, further up towards Raleigh where you've, you know, got a lot, lot of flow velocity. So the, you know, the, the, the river, I mean, they're almost, you know, they're, a lot of them are tidal moving, you know, so far up into the system. Uh, so the, the the flow velocities of the actual sediment input of what's coming in, <clears throat> into Pamlico Sound is probably a very small fraction of what's in it already. What's you know what's moving you know what's moving around and and filling in these channels is just the resuspension of material and it moving around and um, you know when you, when you dig a channel deeper, um, essentially you're you're giving you know you're creating a bigger cross sectional area and so the the velocities down that channel are lower. Than they would be anywhere else, and and anytime you dig a, an artificial channel, it's it's you know it's always going to fill in with that sediment. So it's more of a resuspension of the sediment, and it moving moving around, being mobile within the. Well, in that regard, and, and you were talking about sound. data availability availability of data earlier. Would there be any data on core samples taken from the sound fifty years ago? 25 years ago versus samples that are taken now, which would maybe quantify how much more or less seal or, or, or fine particles are in the sound now? Um, th that's a good question. I, I know um, I know that there are some researchers looking at um, overwash fans um, closer to the, you know, closer to the backside of the islands and trying to see how, you know, relating these 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 overwash fans, the sand, even buried sand, so like paleo, uh, overwash fans and trying to relate those to old storms and things like that. I'd say probably, I, I don't know if researchers would specifically take cores in the, in the same exact location looking for that thing. There, there may be, I, I'm just not aware of it, but, um, certainly, you know, bathymetric surveys as well. You know, you could see areas that would be, you know, that would, that would be shoaling in, uh, and they probably are around, you know, the river, river input areas where there's high sediment. One of the, one of the things with uh, Pamlico Sound, uh, I mean, it, when you look at Ice Age runoff, and I mean, it was massive. You had 3,500 years of just gushes of water coming into Pamlico Sound, and and what we're dealing with now is the impact of 17,000 years. Yep. Quick question. Um, so the the water runoff we're receiving here is it coming from Virginia or coming from Western North Carolina? Uh, pr probably a little bit of both. I mean, each, each river system would have its own, its, its own watershed, but I, I think, I think most of, mostly North Carolina. Yeah. One, one question. Uh, tonight you're asking the, the board to approve recommendation number one. Number one. The other recommendations, what are the triggers when we need to be 
deciding now it's time to go? Are you going to come back at a later date and give us those triggers? Um, I, I think I think we'd like to move forward with number two as as fast as possible. I know that that um, Brent has been working, you know, budget numbers of of you know what he's he's got the ability uh, for uh, within his department, but. We're going to want to we're going to want to move forward pretty quickly with that if because of the lag time that it takes to get the funding in place through the the matching with the with the state i mean all those sediment cores should be you know cost shared with the with the state through the shallow draft fund i would say that one would be one that we want to we want to advance you know fairly quickly and then i mean it, we probably aren't going to pull the trigger and start taking those cores until after we have this meeting with the agencies. But I think getting that request in to, um, you know, to, to the state as soon as possible to start that process that they have to go through to get the funds in place. Um, I think that would be a worthwhile endeavor. And then you mentioned grant funding for the thin layer placement. I mean, is that something that would be available to us, or is that only available one time for that project? No, I think there needs to be, needs to be some offline discussions with folks at the Corps of Engineers that deal with those CAP 204 projects and the beneficial use, um, as well as kind of screening those beneficial uses and digging in a little bit. There's probably some politics to be played there uh, in order to to you know to, to to stack up against the other people. I think the first ten of those beneficial use projects, when they first authorized ten. I think they got 90 different applications in. Um, so I think there's probably some coordination that needs to occur with the Wilmington district and, and folks maybe at the, at the state and federal congressional level um, to figure out how best to how best to pitch that option. And also we need to get the state to buy into the idea of thin layer placement. Yeah, that, that's been a that's been a hurdle. Yep. All right. Well, Ken, thank you. You're looking for a recommend if us to. Um, <clears throat> Approve recommendation one, number one. Is that correct? Correct. Um, is I'd like the, to make that. Is the board approve. prepared to make that? I'd like to make a motion to re approve recommendation one, and take into consideration at our retreat uh, the possibility of moving ahead with recommendation two. Okay. Can, can we add number four to that too? Can we at least start? Is that the core? Is that the core? Advancing the GIS. No, the GIS capability. Yeah, GIS should be easy one, I think. Yeah, we can add that. All right, recommendation is to is to approve recommendation one and four and and con and, and, and consider and, and consider two, two and at four the at the retreat. Okay, I'll, consider I'll two put, and four at the retreat. I'll just put the the recommendations at the retreat as a okay. agenda item. We don't need right. to, okay. that'd be fine. Right. <coughs> and somebody I'll gave a, somebody mentioned a second was it was the vice chair. Uh, all right. Any further discussion? Just curious what the financial commitment of the decision to pursue recommendation one. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, she goes. That's what we're doing. Zero. Zero. All right. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Ken, thank you so Great much. Great to see y'all. Great for report. Appreciate Great all job. your help, all your work. County manager. Yes, sir. Item nine is a. Declaration of a conservation easement for Alice Holdings. Several meetings ago, you all approved the conservation easement. Um, when we did that, we went back and we looked at it, and we changed the language in it to basically give us an easement over on Alice Holdings property to stage should we need to paint our water tank and all that sort of thing. So I bring it back to you for, I guess, reapproval since we changed it from the version that you all actually approved, but it changed to our benefit. Move to approve. Second. Second. All right. There's a motion on the floor by the uh, Commissioner House to approve, and it's been seconded by Commissioner Bateman. <clears throat> the floor is open for any additional comments. Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And then item 10 is equipment financing, and I'll turn that over to Dave. Hey, Dave. How are you this evening? Fine. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, you remember at the um, when we did the mid-year budget adjustments, you approved uh, uh, doing capital outlay for the year. So this is mainly garbage trucks, ambulances, and sheriff cars. Um, we're financing two, almost 2.2 million. Uh, we took five bids. All bid, we took bids. There were seven responses. Um, all of them were less than one percent. Uh, so we're doing 36 months. 
at a rate of 0 0.6734, which uh, the winning bid was Bank of America. Um, so to finance $2.2 million over three years, it's going to cost us $24,000. Uh, that's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ten more. That's, that's <laughs> it's unbelievable. That's, 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 that's kind of a no-brainer. It is. Um, so, um, yeah, we're, we're, I, did, I didn't bring the agenda sheet, but whatever Sally asked you to approve, I'll ask you to approve, please. <laughs> I'm living I'll, I'll in bizarre to approve times, guys. The resolution. We are living in bizarre times. Yes. We're lending millions of dollars with no interest while simultaneously flooding the SIF system with trillions of dollars just fabricated out of thin air. Yeah. I, I swear to God. So I motion don't, on I the floor by the Commissioner ends. House to approve. Is there a second? I second it. I'm sorry. I, I was a Jim. Okay. Commissioner uh, Tobin, any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, Dave. Can you get, hey, can you get us a little bit better rate? <laughs> you get some rates for me. Can, can, we, can we get 6.6? 6. <laughs> 6. 6. <laughs> Next is the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, we have the approval of minutes from the March 1st meeting. We have a budget amendment for increased emergency management performance grant revenue. We have a health and human services, public health division, additional COVID 19 finance fund or vaccine funding, tax collectors report, and a public works budget amendment. Move to approve. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner House. It's been seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Next are your board appointments. Uh, the first is the Redanthe Wave Salvo Community Center. Joey O'Neill resigned back in October, and the Community Center recommends Cheryl Blankenship to complete his term, and there were no other applications. Move to approve, Ms. Blankenship, please. So motion to approve by Commissioner Couch. Second. Second. Commissioner House, any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And the next is the Mans Harbor Marina Commission. The terms of Cindy Holder, Lad Bayless, Jonathan Oglesby, and Jesse Troy Outland Jr. all expire. They would all like to be reappointed. Reappoint. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner House to all reappoint second. all. It's been seconded by Commissioner Tobin. In, any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Put those opposed, like sign. <clears throat> Motion carries unanimous. That'd be your agenda, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, County Manager. That brings us to item uh, 12, I mean, excuse me, 13. That's Commissioner's business. And I would uh, ask um, uh, Commissioner Tobin, would you kick that off this evening? I would like to. Thank you. Um, as you alluded to in your opening statements, uh, I also spent a couple hours with Congressman Murphy uh, at the North Carolina Marine Industrial Park Authority, and uh, we, he's just a great guy. We really had a good time with him. We took him uh, to the H to Navigation, the Coast Guard H to Navigation facility, went on a complete tour of that, and uh, then we went down to Blackwell's where they do a lot of the boat repairs and, and fabrication and uh, had a very interesting time there. But but I think the highlight of it is, and I don't know how many of the board members know, but th they're building at the old gunboat facility. There's one boat in that building, and that boat is somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 feet long and close to 30 feet wide. It's a uh, aluminum catamaran that is uh, going to be outfitted with a submarine and also with a helicopter. Uh, it's fascinating. It's a huge project. And it's something that, speaking of dredging, it's something that we're also going to have to do a little bit of dredging at the bottom of that boat ramp uh, on when we go and launch it. But it's uh, I'll keep you posted on when the launch date gets closer because it's going to be something you're going to want to see. Um, Congressman Murphy's also totally 100% percent behind all of our dredging needs. He gets it. He understands it. He knows the importance of the inlet and all of our waterways. He's also also already negotiated some money for dredging for Dare County. So uh, it's it was a very positive, positive meeting. And next up, I'm very proud to say uh, Dorothy and Benny have been working on a video 
of our new dredge and the, the project. And uh, if we could see that video now, that'd be great. With more than 100 miles of coastline and a wide array of surrounding waterways that range from sounds to salt marshes, the Outer Banks is home to one of the largest fishing industries in the entire country. Critical sectors of the Outer Banks economy rely on access through these channels that serve as a highway for our watermen. Commercial and sport fishing, as well as its supporting industries, which include boat building, seafood packing and processing, and tournament fishing, are all integral to the Outer Banks economy, providing thousands of jobs and contributing hundreds of millions of dollars to Dare County each year. Because the livelihoods of so many people who live and work along the Outer Banks are reliant upon these waterways, it's crucial that they are properly dredged to eliminate the shoaling that takes place under the surface. One of our challenges at Oregon Inlet is to deal with all shoaling issues that we have. There's about 1.2 million cubic yards of sand that move across the inlet every year, and removal of it is paramount. This really affects our recreational fishing and especially our commercial fishing business. We virtually have lost just about all of our commercial fishing fleet because of the shoaling issues. Shoaling's good and bad all year long. When we have a dredge here, typically it's maintained at a pretty good pace, but as soon as the dredges leave, we have real issues with it filling back in real quick. Without proper dredging, commercial fishing boats and recreational vessels both run the risk of running aground in the shallow water. And as a result, many Outer Banks fishermen end up taking their catch to neighboring states whose waterways are more accessible. As commercial fishermen start to take their catch to landings elsewhere, supporting industries such as seafood packing and processing tend to follow. And the impact on the local economy can be devastating and often leads to a negative impact on future quotas. To ensure that vessels are able to safely navigate the channels and inlets that exist in Dare County, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has the responsibility of dredging the federally authorized channels. But a lack of time and resources has significantly held up many dredging projects and allowed shoaling to take over and shifting sandbars to seal off some of these waterways to the boats that require deeper water to make it through. Recognizing the importance of open waterways and the critical role they play in the local economy, Dare County officials decided to take a proactive approach to the region's shoaling problems and begin the search for a long-term solution. We went up to the state and we talked to Senator Bill Cook, who's retired now, and we requested some meetings with some of the other senators and representatives. And we took them, uh, Moffitt and Nichols had done an economic impact study for us. We showed them the value of open inlet, which is about $500 million a year, plus or minus, depending on the year. With a fully opened inlet, it could be up to a billion dollars a year. So we showed them that it was a good idea and we sold them on the idea of having a public-private partnership with a dredge. And we got a 15 million forgivable loan grant from the state that Dare County administers. And well, we entered into a private relationship with EJE Dredging out of Greenville, and they are the ones that are actually in construction with a dredge. The legislation that was required to establish the private partnership to build the new vessel was passed by the North Carolina General Assembly in 2017. This legislation set forth that Dare County's Oregon Inlet Task Force would oversee dredged construction and eventually its operation. A considerable amount of time went into developing the specifications and bidding for the dredge project. And in 2019, the Dare County Board of Commissioners unanimously approved the contract for construction of the dredge, which will be named the Miss Katie. So who will benefit from this dredge? Well, I think all the recreational fleet, but I think the most will be the commercial fleet. As I said earlier, the commercial fleet, there used to be over 200 trawlers in Wallachies. There's just a handful now. And the reason is there's not enough water going out the inlet. We've got commercial vessels right off our coast, shrimping. They can't bring their catch in here because the water's not deep enough. So they're taking it up to Norfolk or they're taking it down south and it, it really hurts North Carolina. The dredge, which is currently under construction in Louisiana, will improve efficiency by maximizing time and productivity to more adequately perform and manage dredging operations throughout Dare County. 
While it is not intended to replace the Army Corps of Engineers routine dredging operations, having access to this dredge will dramatically increase the capacity of area dredging and help ensure that Dare County's waterways stay open. Well, having access to this dredge and having a dredge here full time is going to be huge because we're going to be able to be there right after a storm, hit all the hot spots going in and out of the channel and just constant maintenance, which it's never had. Once it's complete and arrives in Dare County in April 2022, the dredge will be able to operate up to 12 hours a day, weather permitting, providing strategic dredging in area waterways. As previously mentioned, those dredging operations will be managed by the Oregon Inlet Task Force, whose members will plan, schedule, and monitor the success of local dredging projects. The Oregon Inlet Task Force is the overseer of all of it. By state law, the state put the task force in charge of the project. Uh, we will schedule when and where the dredge goes. Really, it's a North Carolina dredge, but it'll be between Oregon Inlet and Hatteras to begin with until that loan's paid back. But if there's someplace else that needs it, you know, we can schedule for it. The public-private partnership dredge project marks a massive step forward in Dare County's ongoing mission to Home keep center. these vital waterways open for commercial and recreational vessels, an effort that will have a profound and positive impact on the area's economy, local workforce, and the livelihoods of everyone living on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I'm just really excited about getting a new dredge here. It's a project that uh, has never been done anywhere else in the United States. There's a lot of other municipalities. Virginia Beach is real interested in how we've done this. And I've been told there's, there's harbors both on the West Coast and the East Coast that are watching to see how successful this is. And if it is, I venture to say there'll probably be more private dredges doing this. Well, big shout out to Dorothy for managing this project for us and to Benny. It, it, was, a, it was a good thing. And uh, I've got some very exciting information to share with you guys now. Today, this morning, they started cutting steel. So it's official. It's under construction. <laughs> Fantastic. Rob, that's for you. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm a true believer. That's all I have, Chairman. True believer. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Tobin. That, that was a uh, that was a great video. Benny did a great job. By, by the by the way, that. I put that video on our Pirates Cove website, and we've had several thousand views of that video. Oh, already. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. That, that was great. Great job. Thank you. And uh, great news to hear that steel being cut. <clears throat> Commissioner Ross, uh, I only have one item I wanted to share. We continue to meet a small subgroup regarding the Dare County or Outer Banks event site in Nags Head. Uh, it's being chaired by Lee Nettles of the Tourism Board. Uh, it's got a number of representatives on that group or uh, participating with the group as I am. And uh, we had a guest speaker explaining a lot of the South Padre Island event center in Texas this past meeting. I mean, he was a fine fella, nice presentation. We have not gotten past the basic hurdles. What are we going to do with wastewater? What are we going to do about a hotel, which is being fairly vigorously opposed by the hotel association to be combined with the conference center? And what are we going to do about parking? Um, we're sort of in a chicken and an egg situation. Nags Head will not opine or review or comment on anything until there's a proposal. We don't have a proposal because we don't know if we should propose something with a hotel and with parking without variances or uh, adjustments to the town ordinances. So it, it's, a, it's been a little bit of a frustrating <laughs> experience for me trying to see whether this is going to move forward as an event site or simply remain the multiple 15 acres of open field area that's currently over at Soundside Park. That's all I have. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Ross. <coughs> Commissioner House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the uh, North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries website, there is a uh, survey 
out, and I encourage all of our watermen to take the survey. It's a joint venture between Coastal Carolina River, River Watch, the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission, and the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, and is being overseen and compiled by East Carolina University. This survey is they're trying to determine with the North Carolina fishing communities to determine the effects of water quality in our fisheries. And this is something that we've been trying to uh, put out for years is that a lot of the fishing issues that we have is not because they've been overfished, but because of our water quality as well. And so we need to really determine, you know, which is which. Are we overfishing or is it our water quality? Both entities we can fix, but they need to be able to see what the problems are. Um, so I encourage all of our watermen and our, especially our fish houses and our dealers, fill that survey out and give them as much information as possible. Um, and it can really help us uh, uh, with our quality, quality, water quality issues in the sounds um, that we already know, as we've discussed earlier today with sediment, that there are problems. So um, it'll also help uh, give our fisheries uh, more insight of what's going on in our, in our habitats. Um, so yes, please definitely go on the website, fill, fill out your surveys. Um, I do not have a pet of the week. I know that's one of our favorite things, but the good news about it is because we couldn't film one today is because they were moving today to go to their new temporary home um, and I say it's a new temporary home because it's a new temporary home because hopefully you will go to the new home, the new temporary home, and take one to your permanent home. So they're being moved over today, and that's the reason why we do not have a pet of the week this week. Um, but uh, And I do believe we have the ribbon cutting on... Big day, Friday. Friday at 11 o'clock. So 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Yep. And uh, I'm really excited about that. And... Uh, when I, when I was hearing about it today, we're moving the animals over today. I was thinking of the old uh, adage, uh, herding cats. So I'm sure they probably had to do that today too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I don't have that, but I do have uh, our day in history. In 44 BC, Julius Caesar was assassinated. In 1767, President Andrew Jackson was born. And in 1933, Chief Justice Ruth uh, Ginsburg was, was born. And on this day in 1820, Maine was entered as a 23rd state in the Union. With that, thank you very much and good evening. Thank you, Commissioner House. Did I hear something today was, uh, today was National Pie Day or something? Was that was yesterday. Was that yesterday? Yeah. Oh, okay. I couldn't remember. I Come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last Monday, uh, I participated along with uh, Dare Center in the March for Meals program and delivered meals to the homes of some of the seniors in the county. And I'll tell you what, guys, this is a great program. I know you've all been invited to uh, to to participate in this, and I would encourage you to do so. It's uh, it's really uh, a great program and certainly beneficial uh, to those folks uh, who, who need it. Uh, I want to thank Derek Kelly uh, for uh, coming on and, and having uh, the broadband discussion. I hope that clarified a little bit of, of something that may have been confusing on some other points. Um, but in addition to, to that, uh, I also spoke with the Government Relations Director of Charter Spectrum and requested that they have their engineering department uh, get an estimate of what would be required to get their services uh, into the mainland areas of, of the county where it does not exist. And uh, he is asking his engineering department uh, to do that. Uh, I will follow up uh, prior to our uh, retreat uh, to hopefully uh, have some, some idea of, of what that is. And basically that discussion was to find out uh, how they could potentially be incentivized to to get their service out there. 
I mean, it would represent uh, for folks that, and I'm the same way, folks that have 10 meg service to go to, uh, uh, you know, 400 megs if they want to, certainly 10 times at 100 megs. So um, as, as you heard from that uh, prior discussion today, that uh, that would more than suffice to, to uh, satisfy the needs of, of families that have three and four computers running all at the same time. So anyway, that is, uh, that is underway and hopefully we'll get something uh, that we can work with uh, off, off of those discussions. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Appreciate all your hard work on that. Commissioner Bateman. I'm just fortunate to be here. <laughs> well, we're, we're fortunate to have you. I have nothing to share. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Couch. Irvin, I was hoping you'd kill some time, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, proud to uh, announce uh, or just make you aware, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's been in the voice, it's certainly been in the Island Free Press. They're starting today on the Hatters Village multi-use pathway, which is really going to be nice. It's, it's nice to see the village down there uh, kind of come, come out a little bit and, and recoup. Uh, the pandemic has been really hard on, uh, on uh, just some of the shops, uh, some of the restaurants. I mean, Hatters Village has got some great restaurants down there, so... Uh, this pathway. It should be done by August, and uh, so the next time you get down to the village there, I think you're going to see some concrete flying around, but it's really nice. It'll be a showpiece. And uh, just the second thing, being in the tourism sector like all of us are, uh, if we missed six weeks uh, or thereabouts uh, when the these drastic uh, forecasts for what could or uh, what could conceivably happen to our population uh, when this occurred. Now, if you think 2020 was a, was a zoo, here comes 2021, because we got there six weeks back, and that was just a uh, warm-up for what's going to happen in 2021. I think it's going to be a bang-up year, and uh, uh, here it comes. So 2021 will be interesting to see is going to, it's going to be the typical demands and stresses and uh, highway issues and wall-to-wall and -wall traffic. But, uh, you know, the Outer Banks is, is, is a destination. They're coming. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Couch. I couldn't agree more. They're, they're already here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, county manager, that brings you to county manager's business. Yes, sir. A couple things. One, um, down in Hatters at the South Ferry Channel, we've been trying to dredge that out for a while, and, and they've had some difficulties there. Um, we've had a breakthrough. They've gone, they finally got the hole punched with uh, side catcher. They can get in there with a, a hopper dredge and actually do the dredging. Uh, the result of the problem with getting through that little 20 foot, 200 foot section there, and the delays are going to cost some more money and require about 10 more days of dredging. Uh, that 10 more days of dredging exceeds our dredging budget by about, it's, I don't know, $58,000 or thereabouts. So what I'm asking you tonight is to authorize me to take $60,000 out of the, our contingency fund and move it over to the, dredge, the Hatteras Dredging Fund and sign whatever appropriate budget amendments I need to do that so that we can complete that project. That will then exhaust all of our funds and actually end, it'll end right at the close of our dredge window, so we won't be able to do any more dredging down there this year anyway, but uh, this will allow us to finish that project. Move so to approve. There's a motion on, I mean, there's a motion on the floor to approve by Commissioner Tobin, Commissioner Second. House, Second. Vice Chairman <laughs> The right, Commissioner the roll call it. <laughs> We do need somebody to second. Right? I'll second it. I'll second it. <laughs> Commissioner Payton. <Bateman. laughs> Those, those in favor, the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion They have unanimous. struggled down there. Yes, they have. Just a several heads up. Um, several a meeting ago or two meetings ago, we talked about moving an easement over there on, on uh, Airport Road to put it between two property lines. We sent the, our uh, water crews out there with our ground penetrating radar, and sure enough, there was a culvert there. And so we haven't signed or done the easement told the property owner that before we would move forward, he's got to figure out how to get that culvert moved to the place where he wants it uh, because it's obviously connected into some kind of a drainage system there. So 
that's just out there if you hear about it. Um, that's going to trigger some discussions at our retreat about stormwater in that area and that whole culvert system and some ideas and thoughts we need to go through about that as well. So just a heads up on that. Um, secondly, we agreed uh, at the last meeting to purchase the Mako's Mike property in conjunction with Kill Devil Hills to build an EMS station. I wanted you to be aware, we, we had a purchase price on there and that's not changed. Um, we He has talked with his accountant, he may be able to get some tax deductions by doing a, a donation. So our purchase price, what we're gonna pay remains the same. He may make the purchase price higher and donate the difference and that contract, if anybody would look at it, would show a purchase price higher than what we approve, but it will show what we're paying to be exactly what we approve. And I didn't want there to be any confusion in case somebody saw or looked at it. You needed to know that's why that's there. Um, and then the final thing is uh, the chairman, you brought up the Rodanthe boat dock project, and that's a good thing. I will say I've started getting some phone calls from people that use the dock and from some of the businesses that are relying on the people that use the docks. And they're concerned that the long closure is going to negatively impact them. And, and I get that. Um, Brent has been working to try to figure out what we can do to resolve some of that. We went to the Wildlife Resources Commission to see if we could delay the project to the off time of the year to lessen those impacts. Um, they'll let us delay it, but what they said, if we delay it, it won't come back on the rotation for three or four years, and they can't guarantee that they'll even have any money then. So delaying the project is not an option for us. We've been working for three years to try to get this done. We can't delay it three more and then find out we can't do it. And so that isn't an option. And so the other options are to try to find out if there's some way to allow use while it's being constructed. Don't know whether that'll work or not, but we're at least having the discussions. We certainly want to have as few impacts as we can. And if we can help these folks and still get it built, we will. But <coughs> a lot of that's gonna be under the control of the Wildlife Resources Commission and, and we don't know about it. So, but we are working with the folks. We wanna help them if we can. And I wanted you to know that in case you get phone calls. We're aware and, and we've been working and Brent's been working hard on that uh, as we speak. So. Those are the only things that I have. Bobby, Bobby in that same I, regard, uh, just just so the information's out there, it's my understanding that uh, Wildlife Resources Commission has a has a project underway now at the boat ramp that's beside the uh, Pirates Cove Bridge, yes. and uh, going over Roanoke Sound. And my understanding is that, and they've got that blocked off right now. And my understanding is that that's going to be opened back up uh, about the middle of May. So that one, that that landing is going to be out of out of whack too for a while. It's going to be great because the the overwash they were getting is affecting the road coming in there. It was flooding constantly, and they're building that up. I think to to avoid uh, avoid the flooding. So a lot of work being done. Uh, it's going to catch spring well, spring fishing for sure. But uh, well, and just to add on to that a little bit, Wally, they, they're saying mid May to the end of May for completion, but. They're increasing the amount of parking spaces. They're going to actually have boat parking or trailer parking spaces coming almost all the way out to the light. Wow. That's which is good. Needed. Yeah. <laughs> and in Redanthe, we're trying to accommodate a lot of uses. We're try we've got to keep an access way open because we've got a helipad there. If we had to use a helipad, we've got to be able to get in and out. We've got a recycling drive up center there. We've got to be able to have access to that as well. And then we have the commercial fishermen who use on the other side of the ferry dock where they come in and put their crab pots and their, that kind of thing. We've allowed that. We'd like for them to continue to do that. So if you allow all these other accesses, they still have to have somewhere to stage all their materials and do all that work. It really fills that site up quickly. And so I don't know what the options are going to be or how we're going to do it, uh, but I do want everybody to know we're working on it. Let me, let me ask you and Danny, uh, question. It was brought to my attention that there's an ar area just south of the harbor that was used as a ramp a long time ago. What are they referring so, to? So the ramp that they're rebuilding isn't really a ramp. It's, it's moral that was placed to allow a slope, but it's not built like a ramp that you would normally have. It had some problems and it's very difficult to maintain and you know, it, it wasn't a very good ramp, which is why it's being replaced. I understand the same thing. You were that there's a there was a similar ramp that's now overgrown, 
on the other side. Right. You know, again, whether that's there, whether we, we aren't going to be able to do much under the water there without going in and getting new permits and doing all that stuff. You know, could we do something that doesn't require a permit and make that accessible? I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know if we could do that, how it would accommodate the traffic or the parking or what that kind of traffic would do to their construction. And I mean, there's a lot of variables we just don't know, but we're talking to wildlife resources about that. Okay, good. Just look into it. Just, yeah, we you are know, is, working on it. So we can, so we can, you and know. And I probably got the same call as you did, because I, I assured that guy we would look at all those options. Okay, good, yep. good deal. All right. Okay, well, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Bobby. <clears throat> Ms. Hester, public information officer, you have anything else for us this evening? Just make mention of the ribbon cutting for Friday. Um, Commissioner House mentioned it, and it is exciting. And I am watching the weather very closely. <laughs> um, so you're saying you're going to bring us umbrella? <laughs> I may even have to get a tent, but I haven't made that decision yet. Okay. I just I'm hoping with 50 people we and just because of the layout of the facility, we can't go inside. Um, so we will be outside. You may need some rain gear. We'll be sending updates to those who are attending um, just as a reminder as to what the weather's going to do. And just for the public, it's disappointing because it can't be open to everyone, but it is going to be available online. And I'd um, like to give a shout out to Current TV because they went in and did a walkthrough so that at the end of the virtual ribbon cutting, the people watching will get to see what it looks like inside because we thought that was Great. really important. And the SPCA, I think, is planning to open that afternoon um, to the public, but of course with limited numbers. So right. they're kind of reminding people not to flood in because, you it's know, they, 25 it's, capacity. That's right. So yeah. somewhat limited, but they'll well, we have should, lots of time to go and visit if it's, you know. We should be used to rain. As Recent years, every ribbon cutting we've done is <laughs> well. I think it, it's yeah. iffy for the morning. I think it's going to get worse. I mean, we're going to have some rain tomorrow and some other days, but yeah. um, it looks like there's also some wind. But I yeah. am keeping my fingers crossed. I okay. ask y'all to do the same. Good deal. Thank you, Dorothy. Mr. Clawson, our finance director, you got anything else for us? No, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, with that being said, we need a motion to adjourn until 9 a.m. on April the 7th. So moved. It's about, been a motion made by Commissioner Ross, and it is seconded by Commissioner Tobin and House. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously.